affordability term sheet. Um, so this is as deeply affordable as HPD's term sheet goes. Approximately 15% of the units will be reserved for homeless individuals or families. Um, all units will be rented to families earning 80% of AMI or below with 50% of those units being reserved for families earning at least 50% of AMI or below. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Shishma went over this really eloquently in her slides. Um, we're essentially looking to merge some of the smaller blocks into a bigger block. So the two purple shades on the left will be merged to be one purple shade on the right, and the brown and blue on the left will be merged to be the blue on the right. Um, and so this would allow us to construct the new typography of buildings that we're proposing. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now we see the purple here will have will build three buildings. Um, the green, each would the green L, each are 80 units, and then the, the blue, um, 40 units, so 200 units in that uh, top section, another 200 below, again, two 80 unit building, one blue, um, which is a 40 unit building, and then several um, 40, 80, and 40 again. Next slide, please. Thank you. The ULERP um, action or timeline for, sorry, not action, timeline for phase five is the same as site 26A because it's part of the same application. And so we presented to the community board um, three times over the last uh, several months. Uh, their review process was from May 4th to July 5th. Our, our president, we're here presenting to you um, today, July 21st. We're hoping to present to city council, uh, the city planning commission on August 10th. And uh, subsequent to that, we hope to present to the city council in the fall. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry if I went over time. Uh, I think these are really good projects and I just wanted to make sure I did justice by them. Thank you very much. Um, just one question on this one um, for site 26A. I understand that some of the open space um, has been cut into add, add additional 10 spots. Can you just clarify if that's true and um, why, if so, if, if, it's, if you feel like it's appropriate and, and why? Yeah, certainly. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll, I'll sort of give an answer and then I'll call in my team if there's anything that I'm missing. Um, you're right that we originally proposed approximately 9,000 square foot of green space and um, we dialed that back a little bit to around 4,500 square foot um, to accommodate the parking and the parking was both in a direct response to the community board feedback that we received and also because we thought, uh, given that the site is slightly outside of the transit zone, that it was appropriate to provide a small number of parking spaces to the residents. Um, so it is a 189 unit building, um, but balancing feedback from the community board being outside of the transit zone, um, we thought 10 units uh, would, would be an appropriate number of units. Uh, 10 parking spaces, sorry, would be an appropriate number. So, okay, just to be clear though, 10 were original, added an additional 10 and, and dropped the open space to four plus. There were zero parking spaces originally proposed. And then um, after receiving feedback, we added 10. So it's a total of 10. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Dean or Eunice, anything that you'd like to add? No, that was spot on. All right. yeah, no, you did a great job. We, we definitely, um, you know, tried to strike the right balance in terms of like, at the loss of two units, but um, balancing that with the open space and, you know, we definitely want to create um, the best building possible. And I think the community feedback, we really took it to heart and wanted to make sure we address it. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, this panel is dismissed. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. So we will now open for public comments on this application. Speakers will be called in the order of chat requests. Requests. We will then take some testimony from attendees on the phone. Please note that comments are limited to two minutes. Um, is there any um, members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Tina? We have no requests to testify at this time. Right. Hello. Hello. 
I'm not sure if there's an issue, but Olivia Wilkins, I, I believe, would like to testify. Okay, perfect. Olivia, you have floor. Hello, my name is Olivia Wilkins. I am an EBC leader and I'm a member of the St. Paul Community Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. David K. Brawley, Pastor. I currently reside at Redwood Senior Living in East New York. I am here to testify in full support of Nehemiah and EBC to build brand new affordable housing for our seniors. Nehemiah and EBC has been around for a long time. I fully support this project. It will result in 189 new units for seniors in Spring Creek community, in the Spring Creek community. You see where I live now in this newly senior development, I used to live in NYCHA. So when my newly building was built, it gave me an opportunity to move out of NYCHA into a senior building. I got that opportunity and I'm here to speak on behalf of other seniors that I think would like to live like I'm living for an affordable um, home to feel safe and clean and secure and also it's good to our health. And as I said, as far as NYCHA was concerned, I experienced the, you know, broken lights, the, the mold and all those different things. And I am blessed to be where I am now. We have seniors coming to the building every day, so many at a time, um, asking for applications to have affordable home to live. And as you can see, um, we just don't have enough buildings for the people and all of the seniors in the shelter. They are looking for places to stay and there are still seniors in NYCHA that would like to move out of, you know, that building into a better place. So you see, I am consider myself living in the solution. Now, every building that's being built that can provide and help our seniors for a better place to live. And I consider that we are, you know, sub, uh, solving the problem, making it like me, a happy person, you know, so happy to wake up and think I'm in Paris because that's just what my new home felt to me. And I hope you see me, I hope you hear me, and I hope you feel me. Because anybody who's against this project has to have something wrong with them. Now, either you with me or you're against me. So I'm leaving you with that thought. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Wilkins, for your testimony. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day and, and you know, talking about your experience and so, on such an important issue. So thank you again. Ina, do we have any other folks that wish to testify? Uh, there are no other requests in the chat. I can double check with you. Okay, Apple Bid team, I think that is everyone. Uh, let me just check my script. Okay, if no other members of the public wish to testify, we will close the public hearing on this item. And we will move to our next item. Erin, can you get us started? Calendar item number two, Livonia 4, 220427 HAK, 220428 HUK, 220429 ZMK, 220430 ZRK. This is an application by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Articles 15 and 16 of the New York General Municipal Law and Section 197C of the New York City Charter, seeking a zoning map amendment to rezone two project areas on the south side of Livonia Avenue from R6 to R72C24, 
a zoning text amendment to establish a coterminous mandatory inclusionary housing area. UDEP designation and project approval for four development sites along Livonia Avenue in Brooklyn Community District 16 and disposition of such vacant land uh, to a developer selected by HPD and a fourth amendment to the Brownsville 2 urban renewal plan. These actions would enable four 11 to 12 story buildings with a total of 498 affordable units, 14,313 square feet of commercial space, including a proposed supermarket, 46,747 square feet of community facilities, including a proposed senior center and 15 accessory parking spaces. Community board 16 disapproved this application on June 28th. Would the representative please state your name for the record and present this application? And we promote the project team and they can uh, introduce themselves and we'll get started with uh, Livonia. Uh, Shishma or uh, Hannah, is one of you? Hi, sorry. I don't think um, the entire Livonia 4 team has been added yet. And I think there's still people from the. I, yeah, I just sent um, a message in the chat for some of our other uh, team members to be added. Okay, we'll work on that right now. Yeah, because I saw the, the message in the chat for the team members. So if everyone, I guess, can send their names in the chat from the Livonia 4 team. So we cannot promote some of the folks, I believe, on um, the phone call. So we'll just have to unmute them when they're, um, you know, when you want them to speak. Uh, it looks so. Jacqueline's on the phone. I believe she's been promoted or able to speak. Brian Laughlin, the same. Are you able to um, unmute Brian Laughlin and Jackie, Jacqueline Scarinci? I see they were, they were added. Good evening, Borough President Reynoso and members of your land use team. My name is Jacqueline Scrinchy of Ackerman LLP, and I am joined here by Brian Lucklin of Map Architects, and we are excited to present the Livonia 4 Site C project as part of the Brooklyn Borough President Review. This application represents the city's efforts and investments through a public-private partnership to transform Four city owned sites along the Livonia Avenue quarter, corridor that have too long been vacant and underutilized, with 498 affordable housing units, including a broad mix of housing with focuses on families, seniors, and supportive housing with services, and community facilities to support community health as a key component of the Brownsville plan through fresh food, youth development, and senior care. Next slide, please. 
Um, our full team is here this evening and we want to respect your time. So we'll be here to answer your questions, but also want to highlight our partners at the city from HPD are here as well. And we'll introduce them during the Q and A. Next slide, please. The project was a result of HPD's collaborative community process that started back in 2016 with residents and community partners and developed the Brownsville plan. From the Brownsville plan, HPD released a series of RFPs to meet the community's priorities, including Site C, healthy living and food systems. We will get into how each of the sites meet the goals further in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. The development team partners have committed with the city to continued outreach in Brownsville after they were awarded the RFP. And this slide highlights the continuous outreach and community engagement that have included a series of public forums, the Hope Summits, driveway meetings, and door-to-door -door outreach. We do understand as a team that there have been concerns with communication about potential encroachments on city, city property as expressed at the recent community meeting. And HPD property management has been going door to door to meet with neighbors to discuss these encroachments on a case by case basis. And since it is important to respect and maintain each individual property owner situation. Additionally, we recognize the need for continued engagement with our neighbors as the project moves towards construction and hope to have a collaborative conversation to resolve these. Encroachment issues. Next slide, please. Livonia Avenue is the main thoroughfare in the surrounding area and is characterized by mixed use, residential and commercial uses. Livonia 4 consists of four project sites within two project areas along Livonia Avenue that are adjacent to the elevated three line. Livonia to, to the north, Powell Street to the east, uh, Mother Gaston Boulevard to the west, and you will see here our sites C1, C2, and C3. And you can see further in the distance is the L subway for the Livonia line. Um, to the north are the NYCHA Van Dyke one and two houses, the Tilden houses and the Brownsville houses, which were built in the 1950s and 60s. These are three tower in the park developments ranging in height from six to 25 stories. And then to the south are the two story Nehemiah homes built in the 1980s. Next slide, please. Just five blocks west of the project area one is project area two. And just to orient you to the site, it is bounded by Livonia Avenue to the north, Thomas Boylan to the east, Amboy Street to the west, and Riverdale Avenue to the south. Development site four is sits within the project area. And to the west and north of the project area are the Marcus Garvey Village, which was um, part of a 2018 rezoning. North of site C4 is the 10.5 acre Betsy Head Park, and also the Thomas Boylan Community Garden is located at the intersection of Livonia and Thomas Boylan, just adjacent to site C4. The area is well served by public transportation with the elevated three trains stopping at Saratoga, Rockaway Avenue and Junior Street, immediately north of site C1, and the L train at Livonia and Van Sinderen, and the B14 bus stops and B60 bus stops are nearby to the site. Next slide, please. As you can see from the existing conditions, they're mostly vacant city owned properties uh, that have been historically underutilized and in need of new redevelopment. Uh, just moving to the next slide. I'll now turn it over to Brian Lachlan to discuss the community benefits for the project. Um. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, and again, my name is Brian Lachlan, and I'm with Magnuson Architecture and Planning. And I'll run you through briefly uh, a little bit about the the four uh, buildings that we're proposing on the four different sites that Jackie just described. Uh, but before I do, I, I, I want to uh, focus on the community benefits that we uh, interweave through all four sites and made sure we're part of not only the design and development process, but also um, a, a huge part of what is happening in each one of these four buildings. Uh, so those four community benefits that, that we focused on were housing affordability, economic opportunity, community empowerment, and health and wellness programs. Um, next slide, please. 
we tried to articulate those in four different building designs uh, that each had strategies that were pulled from both the RFP, uh, the the uh, the Brownsville RFP and the the Brownsville plan. Um, and those strategies include um, activating a mixed use corridor, um, activating the streetscape through ground floor uses, improving connections throughout the neighborhood, and then creating active and open uh, space, um, and then supporting healthy lifestyles. Uh, next slide, please. So the first of the four buildings, which is farthest to the east, um, and uh, this building uh, has uh, the kind of unique components at the top. There's a 10,000 square foot community rooftop farm, um, and at the ground floor, there's a roughly 9,000 square foot supermarket um, and local retail space. Uh, on top of that, there will be uh, 225 units of multifamily housing uh, affordable to a range of households in the neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. Heading west down Livonia um, and directly adjacent to uh, C1 is a, is a building being developed by uh, Community Solutions. Um, this building also has a number of health and wellness components like rooftop gardens um, and will feature a community, uh, a, a community based family support center at the ground floor. Um, it will house uh, approximately 80 units um, and uh, will and, and as part of the economic opportunity, um, it will be uh, owned by the Brownsville Community Land Trust and include a job readiness training center at the ground floor. If we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so, again, continuing to move another block west on Livonia. This is building C3, which will be developed by Catholic Charities of Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, and this is a senior building. This building will um, be the new home for approximately 140 senior households. Um, it will include a, uh, a senior center um, with approximately 8,500 square feet um, and will be tied into the larger network of senior focus services provided by Catholic Charities throughout Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, if we could go to the, the next slide. Um, and then last but not least, uh, all the way down Livonia Avenue across the street from Betsy Head Park is C4, which is also being developed uh, by Rats and Development. Um, and the unique aspect of C4 is that it will include a, a 25,000 square foot um, youth center uh, in the bottom floors. Um, so you can see at the bottom of this rendering, there's a large open space um, that will be to, to house uh, multi-purpose rooms and play, play areas and, and, and uh, other types of recreational facilities for, for kids who live in the neighborhood. Um, on, in addition to that, it'll also uh, provide 54 units of multifamily housing. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, and with that, I turn it back over to Jackie for the land use actions. Thanks, uh, Brian. So we are requesting a uh, rezoning from the existing R6, which is the height factor zoning district um, to an R72 C24. And this will allow for the mixed use scenarios that Brian described and allows for the residential component, affordable housing, as well as community facility space to be located within the project. Uh, to designate the rezoning area, a mandatory inclusionary housing area, while all of the sites um, will be subject to a regulatory agreement with HD, HPD or other agencies uh, that will restrict them to affordable housing, this will require that a portion of the site be set aside as mandatory and uh, permanently affordable housing. Uh, also, the next four actions are um, under HPD's authority uh, to dispose of the property and to, to designate the area and the project as an urban development action area and project. Uh, also, uh, finally, an amendment to the Brownsville Urban Renewal Plan to permit residential use. Next slide, please. And with that, um, we're open it to questions if, if um, there are any questions at this time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony today. I think we just have a few questions and um, I'll just ask them all at once and then I'll just ask for you all to 
try to respond. So uh, it's disapproval. Community Board 16 cited unresolved encroachment. Um, uh, joined the Nehemiah Homes. Could you uh, please just identify if the extra area on the Nehemiah Homes is the that space that is in dispute is required to facilitate the project, um, whether the development team or HP is willing to cover the costs of um, removing the encroachments, if the project's viability would be affected by the encroachments, and uh, what efforts will be made to resolve concerns before uh, the ULERP is done. Uh, so for this question, I think I'll turn it over to Michael Sandler at HPD. Thank you, Jackie. Um, my name is Michael Sandler. I'm an assistant commissioner at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, thank you for having us this evening. Um, I'll try to get through all of those questions, but if I miss anything, feel free to ask any follow up. So, first, uh, you know, at HPD, we want, really want to acknowledge the leadership and the investment of the Nehemiah owners who long ago led the conversion of blighted land into affordable housing and whose commitment to Brownsville helped form the foundation of this investment in transforming city sites. Um, on any sites that have been vacant for a long time, it's very common for there to be minor encroachment issues, especially from fences and walls. Um, on this project with four sites and 12 neighboring properties, there are some encroachments, most of which are very minor, but some of which could impact the feasibility of the, the developments. Uh, the Nehemiah Homeowners Association has been very vocal and correct in pointing out a history of poor maintenance of these vacant sites and the real impacts that bad poor maintenance can have on neighboring property owners. We understand that these owners have invested in their properties and the conditions on the lots have necessitated additional investments in fencing, pest management, other investments. Um, the HOA and the homeowners have also repeatedly flagged communication issues between the city, the development team, and the homeowners. And so I, I do want to apologize for those communication issues. We have, as you see, four different development sites, different developers, a lot of, lot of parties here. And so uh, we've had some challenges with uh, turnover on our team and that's, that's caused these issues. And I, I apologize for them. Um, in the past, HP has also been hesitant to speak at public forums um, or with the homeowners association about the specifics of any issues without having first spoken directly with the impacted homeowners or property owners. So as of now, we have contacted all of the impacted property owners in writing. Um, we've also coordinated with our property management team who've let us know that they went in person to each impacted home in 2019, um, leaving notes behind for anyone they were not able to speak with. Um, at that time, the conversations were amicable. One of the encroachments was actually fixed at that time. Um, some current property owners have actually purchased their homes since then, so there's a need to kind of restart these conversations, and we want to do that on the right foot today and, and moving forward. So in terms of the specifics, in terms of the number and the location of the properties, here's where we currently stand. Um, of the 12 neighboring properties, five are Nehemiah homes, three of which have had some, have or had some form of encroachment, but all of which are pretty minor. Of those three, one has already been resolved based on that conversation with HPD in 2019. Um, two, uh, there are two more, and we'd like to speak um, with those owners directly about how to move forward. Both of these are adjacent to site C1. The issues are with the fence and shed between the properties, and they range from eight inches to a little bit over four feet. Um, you asked about how these would impact the development. So although these are very minor encroachments, um, they may not impact the overall unit count for the affordable housing development. Um, it would still complicate the conveyance of the properties, which would slow down the development and the financing. Lenders generally will not sign off on financing when there are boundary questions. And you know, HP's objective is to ensure that city on land is maximizing its ability for affordable housing development. I want to work as quickly as possible uh, to, to make that happen and to fulfill the commitments that HPD made in the Brownsville plan to develop you know, a specific set of amenities on these sites. So in terms of how we want to move forward and how to resolve, we really hope to have a collaborative conversation with each homeowner. In the case of a fence or shed that needs to be moved, we think this can be done at little or no cost to the homeowner and with very little impact on the livability of the property. And actually, I do think that you know, in conversation with the owner, this can be done in a way that improves the livability of these properties by you know, installing a new, potentially higher quality fence. Um, and at the end of the day, will result in a, a better maintained property next door with on-site building maintenance, security, landscaping, and new lighting. 
Um, so our property management team, as, as we noted previously, has been in the neighborhood, um, looking at sites, making sure that any maintenance issues are getting resolved. We're coordinating with DSNY on, on maintaining our lots. Um, and they will be speaking with homeowners. They'll be reaching out, uh, but we've already sent our contact info. And so folks don't have to wait for that, that meeting with our property management team, though that, you know, the property management will be there. We can look directly at the fence and talk it through. Um, owners can also reach out to me directly. I know I do see some owners here in the, in the meeting tonight, and I, I, I know they will be speaking. Um, I'll give my phone number now. Anyone can call me. I'm 212-863-8926. Um, or Sandler M, S A N D L E R M at hpd.nyc.gov. And, and yeah, we, we want to have a direct conversation with the, with the homeowners. Um, if they want to bring representation, that, you know, we welcome that as well. Um, and, and, and do apologize for any communication issues in the past. So I think that covered it, but let me know if I missed anything, John. That absolutely covered it. Thank you, Michael Sandler. It's been a while. It's good to see you again. And nice to see you as well. Uh, we will, and as you said, I think there will be some people testifying tomorrow. So thank you for sharing that information and your contact. Um, I think that's all our questions. So we'll dismiss this panel. Thank you so much. And we will now open for public comments on this application. Speakers will be called in order of chat requests, and we will then take testimony from attendees on the phone. Please note that comments are limited to two minutes. Um, Eva, can we get a hey, start? We have Stephanie Roberts McCoy via chat. Stephanie, please begin your testimony. Oh, they got to start video. Huh? Now that I met you, I see you start video. Where? Oh, I wasn't doing it. Stephanie Roberts McCoy, are you available to testify? Uh, Stephanie, I just want to. Can you, you hear me? I'm so sorry. Yes, yes, got you. Now there you are. Okay, please uh, provide testimony. Oh, sure. Um, good evening, everyone. I do thank you um, for the opportunity to testify tonight. My name is Stephanie Roberts McCoy, and I'm asking all of you to stand in solidarity with me and other Brownsville near homeowners and do not support the Euler application for the Livonia 4 project. New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Livonia 4 project development team are leveraging their power to isolate, intimidate, and bully Nehemiah homeowners, some of whom are seniors. This, this manipulation is a violation of our rights, and we seek your support in stopping this injustice. We are fighting back and need your help to make sure that not only are our voices heard, but also that we get what we are asking for. We ask that HPD and the Livonia for project development team to commit in writing that the existing structures dividing the homeowner's property from the Livonia for vacant lots will not be required to move. Several Nehemiah homes are adjacent to three of Livonia for project lots, and by chance, we have learned that our homes have an encroachment issue. For over two years, the Brownsville Nehemiah Homeowners Association consistently asked HPD and the Livonia for development team to provide information about this issue, such as which Brownsville Nehemiah homeowners' properties are impacted by how many inches are they over and if the city will require homeowners to move any existing structures. This information was denied to us. We continue to ask these questions through June 2022 at Community Board 16 Equity Planning Work Group meeting and Yearlip hearing where we were told by Michael Sandler from HPD that this issue is abstract. For Mrs. Sandler and the rest of HPD and the Livonia 4 project team, this may be an abstract issue because they do not live here, and this is just one of many projects for them. However, for us, the homeowners who have a vested interest in the Brownsville community and in our homes, it, this is a real property, and we are real people, and this is a real problem that 
that we want resolved before this project is allowed to go forward. HPD and Livonia Forward Development Team have continuously refused to share any information with the Brownsville Nehemiah Homeowners Association or the individual homeowners impacted. That is until this July 7th, two weeks before the Yearly hearing, when homeowners so began to receive letters from HPD. Time is up if you can wrap up quickly, thank you. I'm sorry, but I'm speaking. Like you got the opportunity to speak, you can let me speak as well. Wait until so, my two minutes is up. So, sorry, Stephanie. Is, um, that that was uh, Aaron from our 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 staff that we are keeping time on the two minutes. So just please um, wrap up your testimony, and we'll we'll hear the rest of it. We need to move our existing structures by August 31st, and nor is this fair. And we are planning to make sure they're not, they're not trying to communicate with us at all. They're just trying to make us move it now just to prove a point. But thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Cheryl, uh, Chanel. We unmute Chanel so she can provide her testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome, thank you. Good evening. My name is Chanel Halliburton. I'm a member of the Brownsville Near My Home Association and Community Board 16. I'm speaking tonight against the Livonia 4 Projects Europe application because HPD and the Livonia 4 development team have made this project a zero sum game. They have made it seem like in order for the community to win the affordable housing it so desperately needs, that the black and brown homeowners who have helped to stabilize our neighborhood and make it a better place to live, that these homeowners have to lose. Over the past year, the Homeowner Association has participated in meetings with HPD and the Livonia 4 development team to ask questions and raise concerns on behalf of our 1,100 members. One of those issues was about encroachment, and while we were asking these questions, HPD and Livonia 4 team, as Stephanie stated, refused to give the association or several impact the homeowners any information, but instead decided to take the path of least resistance. And it's interesting that Michael said this the, there was one issue that was fixed because instead of answering the association's questions and addressing our concerns as a collective, they decided to isolate and intimidate a 73-year-old black homeowner who lived next to one of the Livonia 4 vacant lots and pushed back her property line. This homeowner has owned and maintained her property for over 30 years, and she shared with me that that HPD's or lawyers had contacted her, and when they told her that she was encroaching on city property and needed to move her fence or be subject to litigation, that she felt she had no choice. She stated, and I quote, how could I, a senior on a fixed income, afford to go up against the power of HPD and the resources of their lawyers? Although she knew it was wrong, she felt that she had no other options and allowed HPD to move her fence, or as Michael said, fix the situation, pushing back her property lines. While I was visiting with her, I could tell how much pride she took in beautifying her little bit of piece of our neighborhood. She showed me her lovely garden and pointed out how her flowers, half of the flowers she had cultivated over the years were now blooming on the other side of the fence. She also shared several of the challenges she faced maintaining her property due to the trash, overgrown weeds, and rodents in the vacant lot that HPD failed to maintain. Hearing this homeowner's experience not only made me sad, but also made me angry. This is not the first time homeowners have been bullied into submission by HPD and a group of developers, but it can be the last if the borough president's office stands with us. I am speaking today because HPD and Livonia 4 development team is attempting to do this again with several other homeowners. The development team shared that they want this encroachment issue to be applicably resolved. However, the correspondence that homeowners received was not amicable at all. It was like, you need to move your property, your fence and your shed by August 31st. 2022 20, period. So we are asking the borough president's office to stand in solidarity with not only the homeowner that share her story, not only Stephanie and other homeowners who are currently impacted, and not only the mm -hmm. and my home, homeowners association, but also all of those black and brown people who throughout history of this country have been intimidated, bullied, cheated, manipulated, and scammed out of land that was rightfully theirs. We want HPD and the Livonia 4 development team to commit in writing that existing structures dividing the homeowner's property from the Livonia 4 projects will not be required to move. Thank you, and I'm complete. Thank you, Chanel. I appreciate you taking the time to testify today. Uh, Ina, who's next? We do not have any further requests to speak on this application at this time. Is a uh, Renell? I just see someone so they want to testify. I just want to make sure. Yes, 
that's what you wanted to talk about? Lisa thought to me when I have projects. See if someone is unmuted. It's No, Ronnell's not here. Okay. Hi, I'm Susana Rodriguez. I put my name down to testify. Susana? Okay. Okay. So, good afternoon. My name is Susana Rodriguez. I'm a near my home owner and member of Our Lady of Mercy Church. I appreciate the chance to testify today. I want to say right from the start I support this project and urge the borough president to support it as well. I know it's complicated. It seems like there's some things to be worked out, but we must not lose this opportunity for the city to invest in deeply affordable housing. I have lived in this community for over 50 years, and as a member of Our Lady of Mercy, I was in all the rally, in all the meeting, with to build a near my home. I have participated in conference meeting for the E. Lucan Church, EBC, and the whole owner association, because I care deeply about making my community better. Local power and local influence. I can do better, really. It is our chance to shape this into something beneficial for this neighborhood. The near my home you really want to come our history. This community owes so much to near my organizing Brownsville neighbor who fought for the right to build and develop this home. Not only would this project change this rat infested empty lot into yeah. not new building, better lighting and positive street activity that can help improve safety. And the, and the this building will provide a real affordable housing opportunity. For the I believe that for tonight's new building is a huge improvement over this empty lot. And they will bring almost 500 new apartments to Brownsville that need affordable housing for families, for young working people, and for our seniors especially for our seniors, because there's so much need for our seniors to have a secure place to go. For me, it's a really important plus is that 50% of the new housing will go to local community for 16 residents. On top of the critical new affordable housing, there will be a youth recreation center to help our youth and a career center Lord know our young people need some place to go to occupy this time. Our city is always changing. And I support this project, please bring it, I'm sorry, please help us bring this to a new fulfillment. Thank you for your time and listen to my testimony. Thank you, Susanna, for your testimony. Uh, Vincent Sullivan, are you available? Vincent, uh, unmute and feel free to give your testimony. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so my name is, is Vincent Sullivan. And I am the pastor of Our Lady of Presentation, Our Lady of Mercy Parish in Brownsville. Um, we have two churches, and one of our churches is located just down the block from the proposed senior housing unit of the Livonia 4 project. And we're really around the corner from uh, the C1 and C2 buildings. And today I want to speak in support of the project, uh, which I see as uh, something positive for our neighborhood and for our parish. And my reasons are, number one, um, we all know there's a desperate need for affordable housing. And this project will be a step in the right direction. And the housing it proposes will benefit different groups of people, uh, seniors, families, young people, and people who've been experiencing homelessness. Uh, secondly, I think the project will improve the neighborhood. Um, so besides providing new housing, it will also provide services to the wider neighborhood. 
you know, notably a senior citizen center, youth center, family support center, and a job readiness training center. Uh, thirdly, uh, it promises a new supermarket and a rooftop farm producing fresh food. You know, a grocery store might seem like a small thing, but for people, uh, especially seniors who have to walk blocks to buy food, um, having a good grocery store in the neighborhood will, will be a blessing. And uh, finally, there'd be general improvement in the area. You know, right now, these are spaces which are empty lots, they're overgrown, they attract garbage, and that will all be changed. Um, I think street life will be encouraged. Safety will be improved with adequate lighting. Sidewalks will be cleaner. So all in all, I think this project can only benefit the Brownsville community. So, um, so I urge your support and to thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Father Vincent Sullivan. Yeah. Testimony today. Thank you. With that, I believe we have Susana Rodriguez as well. Uh, Susana gave her testimony. Uh, so, if there's no one else besides Susanna, then we can close this hearing. Did we hear from Ramil? We did not. I called Ram. I called them and they did not respond. Raniel, if you're there to testify, please uh, unmute or raise your hand so we know you want to testify. Okay. Hearing no one else wants to testify on Livonia 4. We will close the public hearing. Have one testimony from Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Aaron, can we move on to the third item? Calendar item number three, Innovative Urban Village, East New York CCC, 220165 LDK, 220312 ZMK, 220313 ZRK, 220311 ZSK, 220314 ZSK. This is an application by Innovative Urban Living LLC pursuant to sections 197C and 201 of the New York City Charter affecting project area bounded by Flatlands, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and Vandalia Avenues and Brooklyn Community District 5. The applicant seeks a range of actions, including a zoning map amendment to change the underlying R5 district to R72C24, a zoning text amendment to establish a coterminous mandatory inclusionary housing area and designate option one, a zoning text amendment to extend the transit zone boundary over the project area, a special permit to locate buildings within a large scale general development without regard to yard distance between buildings, height and setback regulations, a special permit to enable a multi-story parking garage with 500 spaces. These actions would facilitate Innovative Urban Village, a 1,737,234 square foot mixed use development of 11 buildings on a 10.5 acre parcel owned by the Christian Cultural Center. The project would deliver approximately 2,050 very low, low and moderate income apartments with a 25% First went to MIH option one. The residential component would be augmented by 107,000 square feet of commercial uses, 98,000 square feet of community facilities, and four acres of open space. The development would provide 386 residential parking spaces and a separate 500 car park public parking garage. Community Board 5 has not yet taken a position on this application. Would the representative please state your name for the record and present this application? Good evening, uh, Aaron. Um, it's Brian Kelly with the Gotham Organization. Pastor Bernard is going to kick things off on behalf of the team. Uh, the team, though, does consist of a joint venture of the Gotham Organization, Christian Cultural Center, led by Pastor A.R. Bernard as well as uh, Manad Nock Development uh, as our third partner rounding out the team. With that, I'd like to uh, invite Pastor to uh, introduce the master plan development, and then you'll be joined by other members of the team, including myself, to discuss the affordable housing plan, as well as uh, Deshaun Chakrabarty from PAL, the master plan 
architect, uh, David Velez from VHB, uh, as well as Melanie Myers, and thank you for that. Good evening, everyone, and let me first say thanks to Borough President uh, Reynoso for uh, his time and uh, the opportunity to present what we think is a very important uh, balance of affordability and feasibility from the very beginning of this project. Uh, our desire was to produce a development that would ensure residents of, of East New York uh, the opportunity to stay in their community and have the tools to move up the economic ladder. The plan is an opportunity to further foster an environment where community members can inspire each other and not recreate the warehousing models that have failed our communities in the past. We believe that together we can ensure future generations of the community are on a pathway to prosperity by providing all the benefits that Urban Village will include, such as a very important 24-7 uh, child care, a skill-based learning with a workforce training center, nearly 1,900 truly affordable rental residences, including 200 for our seniors, 100 home ownership opportunities, more than three acres of publicly accessible, active and passive green open spaces, arts and cultural enhancements, including a performing arts center, cyber cafe, and a children's playground. Uh, we've also considered, uh, let me emphasize, a trade school that would bring in opportunities to learn and grow in the area of electrical, uh, HVAC, uh, plumbing, and, and carpentry. It would be a livable, walkable community with amenities and retail, including uh, target uses like walk-in medical, mental health, dining options, and a fresh food grocer. We believe that it's uh, uh, an amazing plan, and with the right opportunities to make this happen, make it a reality, it would seriously, positively impact the East New York community. Brian is going to share with you some of the details on the housing side. Brian? Right. Next slide, please. You can go to the next slide, please. I'll summarize the uh, plan that Pastor just walked through, but in summary, it will be a 10-year phase development consisting of 10 new buildings, create approximately 1,975 uh, residences of income-based uh, rental housing, of which would be 1,875 plus 100 home ownership opportunities. Um, it was mentioned earlier, as you introduced the project, um, that there would be 2,050. Uh, there's 75 less residences at this point based on some adjustments to density uh, that we'll walk you through in the presentation. Next slide. Some of the uses which Pastor had mentioned uh, will include a series of footprints for neighborhood retail at the base of each of the buildings, really creating active uses around all the perimeters. As you can see here in the rendering, there would be a standalone performing arts building facing the campus quad, a tremendous amount of uh, new publicly accessible open space, the workforce training center, cyber cafe, 24 seven daycare and childcare with an adjacent outdoor playground. Also an amenity for all residents of the urban village, a shuttle service to the two, three and the L, which uh, our team will walk you through as well. Next slide. I'm going to pass the torch to Vishan Chakrabarty from POW to walk through site context, urban design, um, and the massings. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Reverend Bernard. It's an honor to be here today, and a real privilege to be working on this project with such great partners. This is to orient you to the project site, uh, the Christian Cultural Center, and its 10 and a half acre site sits on Flatlands Avenue between Louisiana and Pennsylvania avenues. Uh, it's surrounded by a very diverse kind of context in terms of everything from um, larger towers to smaller scale housing. And so it sits in an existing R5 zoning area that we are proposing to change. Next, please. 
Uh, at the heart of the site is the Christian Cultural Center. Uh, it's an extraordinarily vibrant place that has services uh, throughout the week and uh, provides many social services and remains an anchor to the project site plan as this site evolves. Next, please. So from the beginning, uh, uh, and it's been about five years now since this drawing was made, but it's always been our intent uh, together to create a new destination for the public in the heart of this site. Uh, and you can see with the red lines extending out that uh, our intent has always been to make the site very public by connecting to the street, street grid all around the site, as well as diagonally uh, connecting to the ball fields bringing all people to a uh, new public space at the heart of the site, space that will be activated by the uses, not just in the Christian Cultural Center, but the Performing Arts Center that Brian mentioned, as well as other community facilities. Um, the notion is that the housing would form a street wall condition around Flatlands, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana, and would actually step down towards Starrett City and allow a great amount of sunlight to come in from the south to make sure that this place was pleasant and airy and always something that was welcoming for both residents uh, as well as the general public. Next, please. Uh, one of the things we've been very focused on is to make sure that the ground floor uses were very activated and we are have really carried forward a lot of Jane Jacobs principles in terms of making sure that there was mixed use, that the blocks were quite small and navigable uh, that there was a mix of existing and new in terms of the Christian Cultural Center and the new buildings, and that we would activate the streetscapes with either retail, fresh food, go fresh food grocery stores, uh, the uh, maisonettes that we'll talk about in a minute, sort of smaller scale housing, uh, and then of course a network of public space to tie it all together, including uh, the uh, Performing Arts Center, and then behind that a community parking facility. Next, please. Uh, in terms of parking, uh, we are providing separate parking for the residents. Most of that comes in the early phases on the east side of the site towards Pennsylvania Avenue, as well as a community parking facility for both the Christian Cultural Center, the Performing Arts Center, and other community uses towards uh, the southern end of the site, uh, which you see there uh, uh, near the Christian Cultural Center in this slide. Next, please. Uh, we have very much listened to the community over these many years. Um, there were various concerns raised about height, and we have tried to strike the right balance between getting a height that creates a sense of street wall and a strength, sense of uh, urban vibrancy and density with making sure that buildings did not get too high. We are right now in the 9 to 14 story zone for the buildings. We've been working with city planning to make sure that the buildings had the right kind of setbacks to get light and air to the street. Um, we should note, of course, that the Starrett City buildings that are very close to us, some of them are as high as 20 stories. So we do feel that we are uh, uh, fitting well into the context of the neighborhood. Um, there's going to be a lot of variety and differentiation across of these buildings and a lot of rich use of very good materials uh, to make sure that these buildings feel like they uh, create a sense of belonging. Um, and uh, it should be noted that the buildings are placed at a minimum of 60 feet uh, uh, between each other to create a sense of street wall, but to also make sure that there's a sense of openness and a sense of sky above. Uh, next, please. Uh, I won't go into this in detail, but we are engaging several state of the art sustainability measures in terms of the technology in these buildings to make sure that this is a green development. Next, please. Uh, in terms of public space, as I mentioned, the site is about 10 and a half acres. Six acres of that 10 and a half is open to the sky. So the majority of the site is open to the sky. Three acres is a uh, uh, publicly available uh, public space. And so the balance of it is actually a street network that's also obviously publicly accessible. We think this is a site plan that's really going to encourage connectivity and walkability, making sure that people uh, of all uh, uh, ability levels uh, and uh, everyone from children to seniors can make their way around the site very easily and very intuitively. 
uh, with a lot of green space to shed the heat island effect and to make sure that everyone feels welcome here from the surrounding communities. Next, please. And just to give you a couple of um, renderings, these buildings are still in the process of being designed, but there was a lot of interest in the community to see the use of brick. This is a very high quality facade materials, making sure that this feels like uh, a, a very uh, a strong, durable neighborhood uh, well into the future. And then you see the Performing Arts Center off to the right, uh, public space uh, at the center of all of that that really forms the heart of the community. Uh, next, please. Uh, at the corner uh, uh, on Flatlands here, you're seeing the supermarket. And again, along Flatlands, a strong sense of street wall in that, again, 9 to 14 story. We would make sure that there are a lot, there are a lot of uh, variety of colors and textures here to break up that street wall. Uh, but something that we think very proudly announces this project to the neighborhood around it. Next, please. One of the interests was to make sure that there was a variety of scales. So one of the internal streets has a, a series of maisonettes that offer home ownership possibilities. And this also provides a breakdown in scale, these smaller two story units against uh, buildings that are sometimes five and then moving all the way up to 14 stories. This is a shared street, so it's going to be very pedestrian oriented and well planted to again, create an inviting place for the neighborhood. Next, please. And then finally, I'm going to hand it over to David Velez, but as I do, I just want to mention that in terms of street management, we've uh, been able to design a site plan that can uh, swing hit between times when uh, the Christian Cultural Center has a lot of activity and therefore needs some more roadbed for street management and the more normal outside of church peak hours when we can actually combine the public spaces to create a greater sense of public space on the site. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to David. Thank you. Thanks, Michonne. Uh, in terms of site access during typical conditions, the project will develop an internal roadway network with vehicle access to the right half of the site via driveways on Flatlands Avenue and Georgia Avenue and Sheffield Avenue, and also along Pennsylvania Avenue. Access to the left, left half of the site will be via a driveway along Louisiana Avenue. Outside of the church peak hours, there will be no traffic permitted through the center of the site. Uh, the design of the internal roadway network was developed within the context of the surrounding roadway network and was coordinated with and reviewed by DOT and DCP. The proposed project includes a traffic signal at the intersection of Flatlands Avenue and Georgia Avenue. A signal analysis, war uh, a signal warrant analysis was prepared for the traffic signal and was approved by DOT. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, site access during church service um, would involve traffic entering from Louisiana Avenue and into the parking garage. The internal roadway along the quad would be opened during church services to facilitate departure of vehicles from the site at Georgia Avenue onto Flatlands Avenue. This proposed traffic pattern would eliminate the present day conflicts between arrivals and departures, which results in queuing along the roadway. On Sunday mornings, an additional travel lane will be provided along southbound Louisiana Avenue so that southbound through traffic, i.e. vehicles passing the site, can navigate around vehicles turning into the site. Additionally, the CCC staff will continue actively managing traffic operations in collaboration with NYPD. Uh, next slide, please. The site's well served by bus transit and is a short walk to seven different bus lines, with some buses being at the project's front door. The buses provide con connecting service to the three and the L subway lines. The project will also provide shuttle service to the East 105th L Street subway station, I'm sorry, the East 105th Street L subway station and the Pennsylvania Avenue 3 station. Next slide, please. This shows the anticipated route of the shuttle service, which will be provided following completion and occupancy of phase 1A of the project. Um, that's buildings one and two. The on-site shuttle pickup location will be adjusted as the project progresses to provide convenient shuttle access for residents. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of pedestrian improvements, the proposed traffic signal on Flatlands Avenue and Georgia Avenue would create a new pedestrian crossing along Flatlands Avenue 
between Louisiana Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue. That's a long stretch there that does not currently have a pedestrian crossing. Um, that will provide, uh, it's gonna ensure direct crossings for residents to bus service around the site. Additionally, the sidewalks along Flatlands Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue will be widened through building setbacks to accommodate the increased foot traffic. Finally, the project design will complement the improvements proposed as part of DOT's B82 SBS project, which focuses on pedestrian accessibility and mobility. Um, thanks, and with that, I'll turn it back to Brian Kelly. Thank you. Next slide, please. The, the depth of our housing plan and the, the, the density of it really enables us to anchor the plan with all of the other uses we've talked about, which really create a sense of community and opportunity and the mobility economically that our team has thrived for for years to create and plan and in which uh, CCC led by Pastor, the Gotham and Monadnock team and the rest of us have met with community stakeholders for the last five years in planning um, and even from the first days of concept, thinking this through and the affordability being the crux of one of the most important issues to ensure that this development is attainable to the community in CB5, attainable to Brooklyn residents and attainable to work the workforce uh, in greater New York City. Um, the paradigm we have to work with is annually the AMI is published um, by HUD at a federal level for each MSA or county. Uh, the AMI in 2022 is 133,000 and change for a family of four at 100 AMI. What we understand based on our research and feedback from the community is the greatest need uh, for East New York and CB5 lies between the income bands of 30 to 50 AMI as well as 60. And we'll show you in our plan how we meet that greatest need. However, we also fully understand from feedback from residents that economic mobility is paramount. And economic mobility meaning giving those who have worked hard in East New York and to push to a higher education level or prosper in, in their salary as they move to be able to stay in the community and not leave. And that means to be able to rent apartments up to 80 AMI or to buy a home up to 100 AMI. Next slide, please. So we going into the Euler process, uh, which started just a few months ago, um, our DEIS referenced the housing plan that would be anchored by half of the residents uh, at 50, 50% uh, at 60 AMI or less, and then the balance split in half between 60 to 80 and 80 to 100. Um, we've had a multitude of meetings with the community board, both pre ULRP and now during the Euler process. We've been in discussions with the council member as well, and we've made some substantial changes even since then, based on the feedback and the collaboration that those meetings have resulted in. So next slide, the substantial changes since then is we did lose uh, some residential units as a result of some density modifications, bringing most of the buildings down to 13 stories at max. So we went from 2,050 residential units in total to 1,975. The more impactful change though is our commitment to the depth of affordability is significant. I'd say paramount to the point that we believe this will be one of the most large scale affordable housing developments in the country in terms of its ability to reach those in greatest need by creating that mobility and that's by having 60% of the rentals between 30 to 50 AMI, an additional 15% between 50 and 60. That means 75% of all the rentals would be at 60 AMI or less. That's possible by having 25% of those rentals up to the 80 AMI band, essentially cross-subsidizing on an income basis, the lower affordability tiers by the higher and creating that mobility we discussed. To also have an impact of social and economic equity and that mobility from an economic perspective, we want to create at least 100 condo or masonette units for home ownership. That would round out the 1,975 homes. We believe the community board, although it hasn't issued a, 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 a formal decision yet, appreciates the conscious changes we've made and the community uh, as, as a whole as well. 
Next slide. In terms of how those residential units would be distributed and allocated, um, they would be on a proportional basis uh, across all income bands. The plan is also focused on reaching a diverse set of households. So you can see here 30 to 35 percent would be two bedrooms and 10 to 15 percent is threes. And then we have uh, the balance allocated between one bedrooms and studio. So a diverse unit distribution of homes proportionally distributed across all income bands. Every building has one front door. Uh, that's the way we design our buildings. They're also based. That's also on how code requires every single building will have its own amenities, including a lounge, a computer lab, a fitness area. And we strongly favor the 50% community board preference for members of CB5 to ensure they have that access and attainability of this new housing. Next slide, please. I'm going to now pass to Melanie Myers to address uh, the zoning actions um, that the plan requires to proceed. Thank you, Brian. Um, Melanie Myers from Freed Crank. There are four land use actions for consideration tonight. The first is the zoning map amendment, which would change the, the zoning for the project site from R5 to R72 with a C24 overlay. And that will allow for the housing and the mix of uses that have been described by Pastor Bernard, Brian, and Deshaun. The second action is a zoning text amendment. Um, there are two elements to that. Well, the first is an amendment to Appendix F of the zoning resolution, and that would be to make the area a mandatory inclusionary housing zone with the option one uh, preference. And that is in, in furtherance of the commitment to affordable housing on the site. Second, there would be an amendment to Appendix I of the zoning resolution to move the transit district boundary uh, line southward from Flatlands Avenue to include the project site in recognition of the mass transit op opportunities near the site. Third, there would be a general large scale, a large scale general development special permit pursuant to zoning resolution 74743A2. And this will establish the site plan and development envelopes for the project that have been described, including the street network and the open space. And as part of that, as part of this special permit, it would allow for adjustments to height and setback, distance between buildings and yard controls. Then finally, there is a public parking garage special permit pursuant to zoning resolution section 74512. And this would allow for replacing the surface parking on the site today um, in, in parking for the performing arts center, as well as the other community facility and commercial uses anticipated for the site with a garage. Um, and this will allow for the space that's currently being used for parking to be used for the affordable housing open space for, that are proposed as part of the project. Um, so thank you very much. And I will turn it back to Reverend Bernard to close. Uh, thank you, Melanie, Brian and, and David. Uh, let me just say that. And we can first, move to the next slide, excuse me. Yeah, let me just say from the very beginning uh, of this project, we had a philosophy around four uh, pillars, environment, people, programs, and sustainability. We wanted to create an environment that uh, people feel warm, welcome, and safe in, and uh, programming that meets the needs of our residents and the surrounding community holistically, and a plan that's sustainable, and that is to sustain the quality of life that we want to bring in the beginning, not only in the beginning, but out into the future of the development. We're excited about it, excited about the opportunity to make a difference in our community and in our city. And I want to thank everyone for their involvement. We have a great team uh, that we've put together. CCC is a long-term stakeholder in the neighborhood. There is no direct or indirect displacement by this project. 100% uh, income-based workforce uh, housing, income-based affordability and rent stabilization allows for families to stay and grow in the community. So the narrative change from the way up is out to the way up is staying in the community and keeping your creativity and innovation 
and making a difference within the community that you've grown up in. The integration of affordable housing, community facility services, and retail, uh, again, makes this uh, an exciting plan and something that we look forward to. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for the thorough presentation. And uh, just have a couple questions. Um, uh, just a clarifying question on the on the shuttle service. Is that just for CC res, uh, CCC uh, attendees, or is it uh, for the residents that will be there as well? Uh, yes, John. Hi, it's Brian from Gotham. It's for the residents of the built the the buildings as well. Um, it can be accessed on Sundays or for special events for CCC as well. Great, thank you. Um, and just could you just run through some of the. What you, I think that you had a slide on it, but just clarifying um, what kind of uh, site uh, that like uh, improvements along uh, Flatlands, Louisiana, Pennsylvania Ave around improving pedestrian safety. Sure, I can answer that one. Um, so there, the buildings will be set back, allowing for more pedestrian flow along the, the sidewalks. Um, there will be the new crosswalk provided at Georgia Avenue. Um, there will be new crosswalk restriping corner curb extensions, median widening, widenings and extensions, um, mostly related to the, uh, the DOT project that's been in the area, but those those improvements are being made to the area. Okay, great. And this last question is on um, uh, parking. How, how much parking is required and how many are provided? Uh, yeah, hi, John. It, it, the, there's 300, 386 estimated uh, Residential dedicated parking, the vast majority actually will be built uh, during within the 1st floor buildings. So parking is infrastructure up front. Uh, secondly, the CC, there will be a public private garage of nearly 500 spaces that supports the functions of CCC as well as the pack. All the commercial spaces and any other community facility. Spaces, which are sprinkled throughout the bases of the various buildings. Um, so we have. Site-wide, nearly 900 parking spaces plus the shuttle, um, and then the pedestrian improvements. So we feel like we've got a strong plan from a mobility uh, perspective. Uh, as to how many is required, uh, I would be remiss to say on the record the exact amount I, for the residential, but I do know that the 386 would require would exceed the amount legally required pursuant to code with the zoning actions because. Most of our residential units are at ADAMI or less, and in the, when you're in a transit zone, those would be waived. So we're we'll, we're now parked well in excess of code requirement. Thank you for that, and I believe um, that's all our questions. So we will um, dismiss the panel, and thank you again. So we will now open up for public comments on this application. Speakers will be called in order of chat requests. We will then take testimony from attendees on the phone. So please note that comments are limited to two minutes. Um, Enoch, do we have anyone that's here to speak? Uh, yes, we have a list of speakers. Uh, okay. and I will call them uh, two at a time. So our first speaker is William Wilkins. Good, um, good evening. My name is Bill Wilkins. I'm the executive director of the LDC of East New York, East Brooklyn Bid, and East Brooklyn Housing Development Corporation. By virtue of the multiple affiliates under my direction, provides me a unique perspective on both economic and housing development. Additionally, I've not only worked in East New York for the last 21 years, I also have lived in East New York for over three decades. The LDC has been in service to the East Brooklyn community for over 40 years, and I've managed economic development programs in New York City, Department of Small Business Services, Economic Development Corp, New York State Empire State Development, and Zones Program. The LDC's mission is to grow businesses, change lives, and strengthening communities. The EBID is one of the oldest bids in New York City and the first industrial bid in New York City. Lastly, as Director of East Brooklyn Housing Development Corp, I have been the non 
nonprofit partner in developing over 500 units of affordable housing in East New York and the HDFC partner of 108 units con currently in construction at 1510 Broadway. Over the last three years and on several occasions as a local stakeholder and expert in economic and housing development, I've been briefed on this proposed development. I've reviewed, analyzed, critiqued, edified the innovative urban village. And today without hesitation or reservation, I fully support this project for multiple reasons and submit. It has the potential to be the gold standard of local bottom up development. First, the Manhattanization of Brooklyn has reached the shores of each New York and local and it's incumbent for the residents, businesses and local institutions that are indigenous to East New York develop and shape the impending transformation. This project is homegrown and reflective of local needs. Secondly, this project is well conceived and checks all of the boxes centered on improving the quality of life for our community. For example, it brings into the envelope affordable housing, home ownership, local retail opportunities, vocational training, parking, and it has a much needed performing arts center. Note, East New York is void of having a performing arts center and be mindful, the arts speak to the soul. To this point, Cranes recently released an article that reflects cultural institutions play a major role in reducing crime. Lastly, it is about time and past due that representatives that have a proven track record and commitment to our community be given the opportunity to transform lives. I submit we must move away from top-down development. More importantly, we need to stop letting outsiders, interlopers, and poachers exploit our urban villages and fully embrace local bottom-up development. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wilkins. Ina, next person. Yes. Our next speaker is Dina Rabiner, followed by John Tritt. Um, I seem to be passed over. My name is Stella Reed. Uh, Stella, we'll get to you shortly. Ina, do you okay. have her on the list? Huh? I'm just making sure Ina has you on the list. Oh, okay. Thank you. Ina, can you uh, add or uh, call the next panelist? Uh, yes, Miss Reed has been added, um, but it, we are calling speakers in order of the list that was provided to us uh, in the chat at the start. So okay. we have not yet. So we, we're not trying to pass anybody over, um, but if there's someone who is not on our list, we will let them know that they have been added. So our next speakers are still Dina Rabiner and John Tritt. Thank you. Dina, you can begin when you're ready. Dina. Thank you. Yep, you can begin whenever you want, Dina. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can proceed, thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Dina Rabiner and I am the Vice President of, of Economic Development and Strategic Partnerships at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. I'm delivering, de delivering testimony on behalf of Randy Pierce, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce is a borough-wide membership and economic development organization dedicated to helping businesses throughout four channels, promotion, support, advocacy, and convenient. The Brooklyn Chamber and its affiliate organizations, the Brooklyn Alliance and Brooklyn Alliance Capital, provide direct business services, technical assistance, and support programs to help businesses grow. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce believes this development is beneficial for East New York and its residents. First and foremost, the Christian Cultural Center is a reputable, long-standing community member that has the best interest of the community at heart. The project will create housing opportunities for families of various sizes and incomes. Their plans call for nearly 2,000 units of rental housing, all of which will be income restricted, ranging from 30% to 100% of AMI, and 200 units 
of which will be set aside for seniors, uh, our most vulnerable population. There are also 100 units of affordable home ownership that will provide our residents and families the ability to establish themselves here for the long term and build generational wealth. Secondly, the plan will create opportunities for local entrepreneurs and business owners to open businesses and employ its neighbors. The center plans to incorporate a host of services and amenities that will not only serve the residents of the new buildings, but the broader community as well. This will benefit residents from across the street, as well as the broader East New York neighborhood. These services include GED programs, childcare programs, career counseling, vocational training, and a performance art set, performing arts center, and open green space to name a few. The Brooklyn Chamber also supports the innovative urban village proposal for the following reasons. Number one, the Christian Cultural Center is a long-term stakeholder in the neighborhood that has helped the community shoulder many changes over the last few decades. Under the leadership of Reverend A.R. Bernard, they have a vision to further support the needs of East New York and bring opportunities for our youth and families. The Christian Cultural Center will continue to operate their church and is partnering with the Gotham Organization and Monod Malk Development to advance this 10-year project. Residents and neighborhoods can have confidence that this is by and for their community. Number two, will create a total of 2,050 units of housing. The plans are for all these housing units to become income-based and affordable. A large portion of these units will be reserved for households with lower incomes, ensuring that members of our East New York community can afford to move in. Also, 200 of these affordable housing units will be reserved for seniors. Over the course of Gotham Organization and Christian Cultural Center's engagement with the community, which dates back to the summer of 2016, they have incorporated community feedback, which includes reducing heights of some buildings from 10 to 17 stories down to 9 to 15, and eliminating income tiers between 100 to 120 percent of AMI. 50 percent of these units will be made available to the Community Board 5 residents per HPD policy. Through the process of analyzing the project, there will be no direct or indirect displacement. Holistically, the integration of affordable housing, community facilities, services, and retail is a win for the community, both those that will live here as well as its neighbors. Number three, there will be many benefits that will be available to the public, ADD such as the Performing Arts Center, school, yeah, yeah, playgrounds, can you, uh, can you care, finalize green space, yeah, retail, parking, and shuttle service to nearby train stations. Of the nearly 10 acres on the site, more than 50% will be open to the sky and a network of streets within the site will be integrated into the neighborhood street network, network making this development part of the broader context. Number four, we'll incorporate several services that will benefit the residents of NYCHA housing into their project. These include GED, Programs, child care programs, career counseling, and vocational training. Number five, this will create economic opportunities for members of our community. This project will create locations for local businesses that serve our community to open up shop, and these businesses will bring both local retail and jobs to East New York. In closing, yeah. we look forward to continuing to work with the Christian Cultural Center on this project and furthering the needs and aspirations of East New York residents. We urge the Brooklyn Borough President to vote to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to remind everyone testimony is two minutes. So let's try to keep it to two minutes. I appreciate it. Nina, who's next? Uh, next, we have John Tritt, followed by Stevie King. All right, John, two minutes. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Okay. Uh, good evening. I want to thank the borough president Reynoso and all the members of the borough president's team for the opportunity to speak. My name is John Tritt and I'm SEIU 32 BJ's deputy political director covering New York City and state. I'm happy to be appearing here this evening representing our 85,000 members um, across multiple industries here in New York thousands of whom live in the central Brooklyn community. And I'm happy to be here to speak in support of the Innovation Urban Village Project. I'll keep this brief as I believe the merits of this project are clear. 
as our member uh, Stevie will mention tonight, the developer Innovative Urban Living LLC made up of Gotham organization, the Christian Cultural Center led by Pastor Air Bernard and the Mundock uh, development has a has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs for the future building service workers at the site it's very important we estimate that this rezoning will allow for the creations of dozens of new good property service jobs jobs that are typically filled with local residents that pay family sustaining wages so importantly we talked a lot about the um, affordable housing this would create but i think this is a really important pro uh, really important point um that should resonate that that this is going to create so much for uh, uh, good prevailing wage jobs so additionally our city is in the midst of a ho affordable housing crisis too many working families have to move out of the city and have longer and longer commutes to get to the jobs that sustain their families this project will create badly needed affordable housing that will help alleviate that burden simply put 32 bj supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build and the developers of this project are doing just that Happy to be here tonight and support. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you very much, John. Ina, who's next? Uh, next, we have Stevie King, followed by Christopher Mack. I'm sorry, who was the first person? Stevie King. Followed by Christopher Mack. Stevie King, are you here? Stevie King. I don't see those individuals. Okay. I don't think the Stevie was is listed as a participant. I don't think Christopher's on, but I'll I'll Chris Stevie should be on. There he is. Okay. I see Stevie. Stevie, can you uh, hear us? Yes. Okay, um, perfect. Okay. Begin your test, my weekly. Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Stevie King. I'm happy to be here tonight representing the 85,000 members of SEIU 32 BJ in New York to express our strong support for the innovation urban village project. I have lived in Brooklyn all my life. When I was 1 years old, my parents moved to East New York. They own home there. Now my daughter and my grandson live in East New York. As well, 6 years ago, I moved out of. The neighborhood of East New York, but I am in uh, still in the community next door in Brownsville. I've worked also work in Brooklyn. I worked there for 28 years downtown Brooklyn at Long Island University. I am a proud member of 32 BJ. Our union supports this project, <clears throat> excuse me, because the developer Innovative Urban Village LLC, made up of the Gotham organization, the Christian Culture Center, and Man <laughs> Mananat. <laughs> Development has shown that they intend to invest in our community. The developer reached out to our union early in the process to make a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs to the future building service workers at this site. <clears throat> we estimate that this rezoning will allow for creation of over 30 new good property service jobs. The jobs being created by this project are typically filled by local members of the community. And because of this commitment, because of this commitment, we'll pay families sustain, sustainable wages, which help bring working families into the middle class. This commitment to good prevailing wage jobs will give opportunity for upward mobility, security, and dignity to the working class family. In addition to the important job creation that will come from this project, the developer has proposed the construction of badly needed affordable housing. Everyone attending this hearing tonight should agree that the creation of affordable housing stock is of utmost importance to our community. This development will create nearly 1,900 truly affordable rental residents, including 200 for seniors. This new, this is a new housing. This is, I'm sorry, this new housing that is truly needed. In addition to the good jobs and affordable housing, there are numerous other benefits included in this development that make it worthy for approval. 32BJ 
supports responsible developers who invest in the community where they build. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standards and provide opportunities for all working families to thrive. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Ina, who do we have next? Uh, it appears that Christopher Map is not on, so we're going to move on to Kate Cunningham, followed by Bishop Parker. Hey, Kate, are you available? Do we have a Kate? There she is. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Cunningham, and I'm the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at the New York Building Congress. I'll be testifying on behalf of our president and CEO, Carlo A. Tashira. The New York Building Congress appears today in support of the Innovative Urban Village Project. On behalf of more than 550 constituent organizations and 250,000 skilled tradespeople, including architects, engineers, contractors, and labor, we firmly believe the development of the Innovative Urban Village Project will be beneficial for East New York and its residents. New York City is currently facing the dire realities of a housing crisis. More housing development is needed now more than ever, and the Christian Cultural Center is a perfect candidate to lead the charge. The Christian Cultural Center, under the dedicated and magnificent leadership of Reverend Bernard, with whom Carlo had the pleasure of working closely with in the past, is a reputable, long-standing community member that has the best interest of the community at heart. Throughout their partnership with the Gotham Organization and Monadnock Development, and over the course of their engagement with the community, the center has incorporated community feedback including reducing the heights of some buildings and eliminating higher income tiers. The innovative urban villages plan will create housing opportunities for families of various sizes and incomes, including plans for over 1800 units of housing, all of which will be income restricted, ranging from 30 to 100% of AMI, and 200 units, which will be set aside for seniors, our most vulnerable population. It also will include many benefits that will be available to the public, such as a performing arts center, a school, a public playground, 24 seven childcare, green space, retail, parking, and shuttle services to nearby train stations. The integration of affordable housing, community facility services, and retail is a win for the community and New York City as a whole. Additionally, the innovative urban village project will incorporate several services that will benefit the residents of NYCHA housing. These include GED programs, child care, career counseling, and vocational training. New Yorkers that reside at the Linden, Boulevard, Pink, and Wartman houses, all of which are in the vicinity of the program, will reap the benefits of the village's plan. This project has the potential to create real economic opportunities for members of our community by creating new locations for local businesses, community amenities, and will bring both local retail and jobs to East New York. The New York Building Congress is proud to support the Innovative Urban Village Project. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Ina, who do we have next? We have Bishop Barker, followed by Marlon Bynum. Bishop Barker, are you available to testify? Bishop Barker. We have a Cheryl Barker, no Bishop Barker. Is a is Cheryl Barker also? Let's see. Cheryl Barker, are you there? Cheryl Barker, are you available to testify on this? Yes, okay. I'm here. Yes. Great, great. Hello. Hello? Yes. Are you here to testify on CCC? Yes, I, yes, I'm here. Yes. You can begin. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Bishop Dr. Cheryl Old Barker, and I'm here in total support for the urban village. And I'm very excited, and I'm representing the pastors and members of our community. Christian Cultural Center 
I want you to know it's a long-term stakeholder in the neighborhood and that has helped the community shoulder many changes over the last few decades, and that's track record. Under the leadership of Reverend A.R. Bernard, they have, a, they have a vision to further support the needs of East New York and bring opportunities to our youth and families that are so needed. Holistically, I want us to be reminded that the integration of affordable housing, community facility services, and retail is a win for the community. This is a win-win for all of us, both those that will live here and its neighbors. Be reminded also that the project will include many benefits that we have heard over and over, but I still want to reiterate that will be available to the public, such as parking, art centers, a school, a public playground, child care, green space, retail parking, and shuttle service to the nearby train residents. This is a win-win project. It will also incorporate several services that will benefit the residents. And myself, the pastors and our community, we are in total support of this project. I want you to be reminded also that these include childcare programs, career counseling, and vocational training. I long for that. We long for that, especially for our youth. The project will also create locations for local businesses that serve our community to open up shop. And these businesses will bring both local retail and jobs to East New York. We need this project. We need this village to, to be completed and to transform, metamorphosize, our community. Our Reverend Bernard has a track record and we need to support the project. It's creating a total of 20, 50 units of housing and we 100% without reservation support this project. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Barker. And uh, next, Dina, who do we have on board? Uh, next, we have Marlon Bynum, followed by Bishop Maldonado. All right, Marlon, are you available? Yeah, okay. I was just unmuted. Yep, uh, you can begin your testimony. Uh, good evening. My name is Marlon Bynum. I'm the principal of Transit Tech Career and Technical Educational High School located in East New York. We just completed our 107th commencement graduation ceremony, uh, which was a huge success. Uh, we have put a lot of young folks over the over the years, not only to high institutions, but we are equally proud of placing our young folks immediately into careers, uh, starting in the, the low 50s and climbing after three years into the six figures. Uh, one of the major uh, things that uh, I continue here with the additional, I mean, with the speakers um, previously talking, uh, is regards to a vulnerable community, uh, housing crisis, gentrification, uh, many ills and challenges that have, have um, hit East New York. These seeds uh, were, were sown a generation, if not generations ago, uh, where the fact that uh, not having meaningful employment, uh, where it can lead people uh, into homeowners uh, and people who can purchase affordable housing. One of the things that we, we really tended ourselves at, at Transit Tech is um, that immediate placement into middle class careers is a surefire way to provide um, people a fighting chance to have a, affordable housing and a, a meaningful place to live. Uh, watching uh, the CCC under the leadership of A.R. Bernard in East New York over uh, the nine years that I've been at Transit Tech and even the six and a half years that I was at Franklin K. Lane, I have seen all that type of development take place with the with not only the people in the community but particularly young folk. What I really what really attracts me to this project is the is one of the first times I'm really hearing uh, people who have these big plans to uplift the community incorporate really meaningful job vocational skills training. That is the surefire way to build up a community. If you look from um, past years and generations of uh, people who flee, um, flee New York City into the suburbs of Nassau and Suffolk County, that is not coming from anything other than strict vocational training and city employment that builds up the, those communities there. The same could happen in East New York. I'm very excited for East New York. 
um, for someone to have the vision enough to include this type of uh, training in a project and proposal that's sustainable, not just for immediate um, type of uh, impact, but long-term impact for the community. So I'm just happy that uh, I'm there to witness this and also looking forward to partnering with, uh, 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 with the community to embrace this project. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, Ina, who's next? Uh, we're still looking for Bishop Maldonado, uh, but if they are not available to testify, our next speaker is Cynthia McKnight, followed by Della Reed. Okay, start with Cynthia Knight, and if Bishop Maldonado is out, we'll put them in the queue next. Cynthia? Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia McKnight. I'm the president of Community Education no, Council, no, 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 the union leader of AFG Local 913 of United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. I'm here to support the Christian Culture Center's innovation, innovative urban village project in East New York, neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. Based on my engagement with the Christian Cultural Center on their project, um, can you hear me? One moment, yeah. Um, can we mute? I think the latest, uh, Reverend Barker, just read that one. Okay, great. Thank you. You can start again. Okay. You want me to start over or? Keep going. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, based on my engagement with the Christian Cultural Center on their project, I believe its development is beneficial for the East New York and its residents. First and foremost, the Christian Cultural Center is an outstanding, long-standing community member who cares deeply for the East New York residents. The project will create housing opportunities for families of various sizes and incomes. Their plans call for upwards of 2,000 units of housing, all of which will be income restricted, ranging from 30% to 100% of AMI, and 200 units of which will be set aside for seniors, our most vulnerable population. They also afford local entrepreneurs and business owners opportunities to open businesses and employ their neighbors. Secondly, the center plans to incorporate a host of services and amenities that will not only serve the residents of the new buildings, but the broader community as well. This will benefit residents from across the street, as well as the broader East New York neighborhood. These services include GED programs, 24 seven child care, career counseling, vocational training, a performing arts center, and open green space, to name a few. I also urge the approval of the innovative urban village proposal for the following reasons. As a person who grew up in Linden Houses in East New York, I know the importance of safe and affordable housing. The innovative urban village project will create a total of 2,050 units of housing. The plans are for all these housing units to be income-based and affordable. A large portion of these units will be reserved for households with lower incomes, ensuring that our East New York community members can afford to move in. Also, 200 of these affordable housing units will be reserved for seniors. This will positively change the trajectory of many of our most vulnerable populations. This project will also include many benefits that will be available to the public, such as a school, a public playground, parking, and a shuttle service to nearby train stations. In closing, I look forward to continuing to work with the Christian Cultural Center on this project and furthering the needs and aspirations of East New York residents. I urge the Brooklyn Borough President to vote to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for your testimony today. Uh, Ina, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Della Reed, followed by Janet Remington. All right. Della Reed, are you available to testify? Della Reed. It's a great name. Yes. I'm you can be the here. <laughs> I'm still here. here. I almost left. <laughs> we're, we're glad we caught you. You can begin. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of Christian Culture Center and Pastor Reverend. Um, Burn on. I've been in Christian Cultural Center since 2006. Under his leadership, I have grown a lot. I thank God for placing me under that leadership. I've been living in East New York since 73. I went to school. I went to um, 
I worked out here at Brooklyn Developmental Center on um, that was on Fountain Avenue. It's no longer there. So, but anyway, Christian Culture Center is a long term stakeholder in the neighborhood that has helped the community show the many ch changes over the last few decades. Under the leadership of Reverend A.R. Bernard, they have a vision to further support the needs of East New York and its residents. And that's everybody. It, it's not just the members of the church either. And bring opportunities to our youth, which is badly needed because our young pe people need guidance and direction in this day and time and for families to keep the families together. Unfortunately, my family, my son, my daughter, they all left New York because they you know, they couldn't afford to stay here. So they they moved and it's just me here, you know, so now I have to go travel to see my family. But past the building urban innovated urban village it's going to be a blessing to all the families of East New York and all the businesses. It's a addition. Holistically, the integration of the affordable housing community, facility service and retail is a win for the community. Both those that will live here and its neighbors. The project will include many benefits that will be available to the public, such as performing arts center, a school, a public playground, 24-7 child care is badly needed, affordable child care is badly needed in, in this community. Um, green space retail parking and shuttle service to nearby train stations. The project will incorporate several services that will benefit residents. These include child care programs, career counseling, and vocational training for, for the people that are that really badly needed that are coming out of high school that may not go to college. At least they can learn a trade or a skill. The project will create locations for local businesses that serve our community to open up shop. These businesses will bring both local retail and jobs to East New York. So I stand in solidarity with the innovative urban um, village and I ask you to help out, support us and help Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Reed, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Ina, who's next? Our next speaker is Janet Remington, followed by Janice Myers. All right, Janet, you have the floor. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Remington. Thanks for the community of Board 5 for having me here on today. Thanks for Pastor Bernard for the invitation to speak on behalf of my community, East New York. I'm a resident of Starrett City, known as Spring Creek Towers. I've been a resident of Starrett City over 26 years and a member at Christian Culture Center for 20 plus years. Since living in Starrett City, I've experienced that initial waiting period to see the primary care doctor takes about three months and to get a referral to see a specialist takes about a month. As time is the essence in preventing illness, as well as quality health care is essential to one's well being, I do hope that the innovative urban village project under the leadership of Pastor Bernard will come to fruition. And as the saying goes, a little drop of water makes a mighty ocean. I do hope and pray that all of our collective and individual ideas will bring about a much desired outcome for our East New York community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Remington. Uh, Ina, who's next? 
Our next speaker is Janice Myers, followed by Carrie Allen. Great. Okay. Oh, there you are. Please begin. I can't. Uh, you have to unmute me. We can hear you, Ms. Myers. Oh, okay. Hi. Hello, I'm, you can begin. <laughs> I'm Janice Myers. Um, I worked for the Board of Education over 27 years. Um, I work with young people. And um, I'm also a member of um, Christian Cultural Center. This innovative Bourbon Village project is an excellent idea. Um, with the integration of affordable housing, community, uh, community facilities, retail is a win for our community. They're opening art centers, schools, library, fitness room, playground, childcare, um, parking, cafe. I can go on and on. I know that it will be under the leadership of Pastor Bernard, an excellent project. And working with children, I see so many parents that are, you know, have children, they have nowhere to go. And at least I have information to guide these parents to some place to put their children. There's a desperate need for affordable housing. And I'm sure Pastor Bernard is the best asset to this community. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much for your testifying. Yes. Uh, do you know who's next? Next, we have Carrie Allen, followed by Lori Majette. Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can be good. Oh, beautiful. I'm glad I stayed on. I didn't think I would uh, get access. Great. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Allen. I am a 30 year resident of Star City and a CUNY assistant professor here in the metropolitan area. My daughter, Brittany Allen, and I have been members of the uh, Christian Cultural Center since 1994. I am here before you today in support of the Innovative Urban Village Project. Successful in its vision, CCC creates a safe, dynamic worship and spiritual growth experience that has led the community, neighbors, and countless others to flourish and thrive in mind, body, and spirit. With each humanitarian and social engagement act, there is inclusion and cultural diversity for all. As an investor and staple in the East New York community, the Christian Cultural Center seeks to provide new opportunities for our youth and thrivation to families. The project will add to the community 24 hour childcare, which is necessary for families working multiple jobs. Career counseling and vocational training will help individuals in the areas of career development as uh, an option to college. Senior citizen programs is, is a necessity, especially for seniors who are alone. <clears throat> Developing over 2,100 affordable housing units, units are necessary steps towards decreasing the housing crisis. Retail, which could, number one, model pricing etiquette and number two, provide fresh foods to avoid residents having to leave the neighborhood or even miss meals because food is so high in the community. Not only will this site provide resources for producing goods and services, but it could promote incentive for others to dream big and give back to their community as well. I stand in full support of the Urban Village Project here in East New York. And I worked hard 
not to go over that two minutes. Did I do it? You made it. All right. Really Thank really you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. All right, Ina, who do we have next? Next, we have Lori Majet, followed by Linda Hires. All right, Lori. Do we have you, Lori? Lori, can you hear us? Are you available to testify? Can you, you have your uh, if you have another device on, I'll just turn it off. But yes, we can hear you. Oh. Can you hear us? I mean, can you speak? Lori, can you hear us? Ina, can you uh, read the name again one more time for me? Yes. Uh, the speaker is Lori Jett. Lori Jett. Majet. M I D G E T T E. Okay. Lori, can you hear us? Looks like she left. Oh, she must have left. Okay. Uh, can we? We'll, we'll put it at the top of the list when she comes in. Uh, you know who's the next person? Uh, we have Linda Hires yes. followed by Nephi White. Hey, Linda, you have the floor. Linda, can you hear us? There you go. Linda, you may begin your testimony. Linda Hires? Linda Hires? You can unmute and testify. She may be having issues with her phone. Okay. Uh, Ina, who's next? Our next speaker is Nephi White, followed by Selena Francis Beard. All right, Nephi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? Thank you so much for having me, Brooklyn Borough President. Thank you so much for all of the uh, the guests that are on tonight. I don't want to be before you long. Uh, my name is Nefertari. My nickname is Nephi White. Uh, I am currently the Assistant Director of HR for Health and Hospitals. I work out of Kings County, and I'm a proud member of Christian Cultural Center over the past 11 years. I'm so grateful to be a part of this discussion today because I am a new homeowner here in zip code 11207 in East New York, Brooklyn. I have been here for the past three years, right before the pandemic started. I purchased a home here, and I'm so glad to be part of this new revitalization of our community. The thing about uh, this project, the Innovative Urban Village Initiative, which sparked so much interest for me, is the fact that it deals specifically with community, a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. I have a vested interest in this community here of East New York, Brooklyn. I stand with my pastor, Dr. A.R. Bernard, Pastor Jamal Bernard, all of the leaders that you heard from tonight, and I really admire the fact that they are really strengthening our community and helping those who own properties, not just rent properties, but to be homeowners. I'm a proud first time homeowner. And just the fact that the initiative sparks 
the opportunity for people to also be able to own in this community really makes me very, very excited. I love the fact that small businesses are included, and I'm a single mother of a 12-year-old son with special needs, and the reality that there's 24-hour child care in this community is very, very exciting for all of those involved and that they are able to get the jobs and things like that, that they'll be able to provide for their families at whatever time they have that employment. So I am grateful for this initiative. I stand by it. And I want to be the change that I want to see in the community. I stand with my pastor. I stand with the leaders here for the Innovative Urban Village in Initiative. And I thank you so much for your time. And I know I made my two minutes. Thank you. Have a great evening. You, this, this panel, this list is good. They know how to handle two minute test. Yeah. I like this. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm our sure. next speaker is Selena Francis Beard, followed by Fonzo Turnage. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Selena Francis Beard. And I am going to be very, very brief because I don't need to say anything more. It's all been said people. So, you know, I have to tell you, I fully support this initiative. I love it because not only does it meet my needs, but it meets the needs of my immediate community. All right. God bless everyone. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Selena. You know, who's next? So I just learned that Lori Majette called in and is available to testify. So I'd like to go yeah. backwards in our list and give her the opportunity to do so. Yeah, let's do that. Lori, are you there? Lori, can you hear us? Lori, do you have a, a do we know the Lori's call-in number? If anyone knows Lori's call-in number, feel free to message that to myself privately, Ina Kusenfeld. Okay, Aaron, uh, you know who's next? Next, we have Fonzo Turnage, followed by Gooey Pond. All right, Fonzo, you are up. Fonzo, can you hear us? Is there a Fonzie in the room? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. You can begin. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, um, and thank you. Thanks for having me. One of the things that I've heard this entire evening, how wonderful this is going to be for the East New York area. But I'd just like to add that this is going to be a wonderful thing for Brooklyn as a whole. We have very uh, many neighboring areas, uh, Crown Heights, bed -Stuy, where people are being pushed out of their homes. Uh, because of high rent and high price, because of gentrification. And I'm just like really, really glad that this is gonna happen, that my church is involved in this. Uh, and uh, it looks like a wonderful place. I live in East New York now for 20 years. Uh, I moved here from Crown Heights and um, it's gonna be right next door uh, to where I am. So I'm grateful, I'm looking forward to this and I hope to live to see it come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. You know, who's next? Uh, I believe we now have a number for Lori Michette, and we can unmute her phone to speak. Okay, perfect. Lori, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. All right, you can begin. Yay! <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Lori Majette. I've been a member of the East New York community since 1988 when I became a teacher, assistant principal, and principal. I've helped raise a whole lot of children here in East New York, and many of my students have come of age and are now in their 30s and 40s. 
They're raising their own families, and they're ready to be homeowners in the community in which they grew up. They are the parents of who I call my grand students. East New York is their home, and it is my home, too. I clearly remember this community the way it was in the 80s and 90s and all that was happening in the streets with our families and to our children. And the one constant that enabled us to change this community around was the support of the clergy, our religious leaders, that walked the streets with us, providing resources that could help save our community. And one of those churches is CCC, which has been my church for 30 years. I can testify that Dr. Bernard and his wife and the congregation of CCC are personally invested in the East New York community, especially the children and youth. And investment means one thing on Wall Street, but it means something totally different in the hood, our community among neighbors and friends. Investing in our community means you have to put some time, care, and attention into something that we can see with our eyes, touch with our hands, and feel in our hearts. Something that has made a difference in the lives of the community, and that's what Pastor Bernard and CCC have done. They understand the assignment and continue to give 110%. For decades, they've gone above and beyond to do a good job in lifting the spirit of this community. They've insisted that elected officials, government agencies, and federal programs make us a priority. And for all the things that will be born from this project, the affordable housing, the daycare and senior services, small business opportunities, positive quality of life, to name a few, I strongly support the Innovative Urban Village Project. This is a gift to our community that must be delivered to my deserving community and with all due speed. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Ina, who's next? <laughs> Great. So our next speaker is Gooey Pond, followed by Randy Whitaker. Gooey Pond, you there? Are you available? We Pond, are you there? Guillermo Pond, are you there? Guillermo Pond, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate being on. Um, I'm having some vocal problems, so bear with me. I definitely won't be long. Um, I've been living in the uh, East New York community since uh, 1966 when my parents purchased a home. I now have a home in East New York uh, in uh, Meadowood. I'm a, I've been a member of CCC for over 20 years, and I thoroughly support the Innovative Urban Village Initiative. Uh, I see it not only as a blessing for East New York, but as a template for other churches and other communities to collaborate, to make their community not only thriving, and, and better, but create a legacy so that our children and our children's children will have something to uh, to look up to and to carry on. And I I I strongly feel that this this is going to be so successful that I dare say it would it would touch not only Brooklyn, New York State, but across the country and and around the world. So with that being said, thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you, Ms. Pond. Uh, okay. Our next speaker is Randy Whitaker, followed by Boris Santos. Good evening. Uh, my name is Randy Whitaker, and I'm a resident of East New York. And I'm here to lend my support to the Innovative Urban Village Project. Uh, we all are aware that our community suffers from high unemployment and lack of opportunities, and it takes real leadership to, to guide us to prosperity. The Christian Cultural Center plans to incorporate several services that will benefit the residents of East New York and beyond. These include GED programs, child care programs, career counseling, and vocational training. In order, and it's been said before, but in order for our kids 
grandkids, nephews, and nieces to succeed, they need tools to achieve success. It is critical that our community receives the plan 24 seven daycare and workforce training center that that project will bring. It, it takes a village to raise our children and the resources that the innovative urban village proposes will help our children to learn, earn and pay it forward to future generations in East New York. I urge the Brooklyn Borough President to vote for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Um, Mr. Santos, can we go? Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Jonathan. Um, Boris Santos, he, him. I am a member of East New York Cypress Hills Community in District 5. Um, also an alum of Transit Tech. Um, and uh, I am for full foreclosure a community board five member but i'm not attaining the uh, uh um in this meeting as that capacity given that the community board has yet, yet to weigh in the uh, i repeat context the community board has yet to weigh in um and i am of the impression that the applicants of this proposal have gone through myriads of robust discussions with so many stakeholders their members a council member you know borough president etc so much that it will be difficult for me to dramatically change this proposal to the degree of my liking. Um, but on June 21st at a community board five land use and housing committee meeting, I had mentioned to um, the Reverend, uh, Reverend Bernard, that his proposal seemed as if he was, and I quote, trying to plan for an enclave or specific part of the community as opposed to the entire East New York community, I end quote. I went on to explain that the location of his proposed development was nearby high density buildings all public housing or publicly subsidized housing, Brooklyn houses, Boulevard houses, Linden houses, Pennsylvania Avenue, Workman, Vandalia houses, Star City, all making a tune of 11,000 units. Um, in East New York, including in these nearby sites, we see low levels of educational achievement, attainment, high unemployment levels, comparatively high crime rates, and general poverty. It would therefore behoove anybody that was planning for the community at large, especially the nearby community, to propose a development that would directly tackle these trends. And although the current proposal does attempt to do so, it does not do so as meaningfully as it could. The Reverend has accumulated a total of 10.5 acres of vacant land over the span of more than a decade to try to realize this, cur this current proposal. But given all this land, we have the real opportunity to use an anchor institution, such as a public university or a major healthcare facility to provide benefits to all East New Yorkers, including major job creation. The current proposal calls for almost all of the land to be used for residential purposes, with the exception of mostly ground floor commercial usage, i.e. there is no special commercial districts, right? No more except for that trade school. And although, and I'm staying in line with what our topic of discussion is here, zoning context, right? Um, and although we as a city are facing a housing crisis, East New York has been doing more than its fair share of providing true affordable housing to our people. Just ask our current, former, and previous council member barons who have been pivotal to putting as, us as a second neighborhood with the most affordable housing delivered in the last de decade. It's, it is therefore time for us to tackle the true priorities that ails our community at large. It was in this vein that I finished my statement by telling the Reverend that he really needs to consider using most of his land for a higher educational institution, specifically a public university. I am wrapping up here. It is this type of vision that will help bring this proposal forward, stated the Reverend at the time in response to me. And I agree with him. And therefore, we must do what we can to bring these developers back to a blanker drawing board and try to bring this vision to life. In Broadway Junction, we see a developer that is proposing over 20 stories of commercial development, basically a skyscraper, to attempt to bring a higher education institution. They are doing so, and yet they do not have as much real estate as the Reverend to bring about a higher edu education campus. Since they are limited as how to they can build horizontally, they will then attempt to build vertically. Here we have again, 10.5 acres of land and practically, practically none of it is to make the East Brooklyn University come to life. The trade school is a great start, but it is nonetheless a start. And I have a fundamental disagreement with how all of this land will ultimately be used and therefore I will urge the board and this borough president 
to re-engage the reverend with this specific concern at hand. Jonathan, it was great seeing you. Send my regards to the borough president. Um, peace and love. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on this item? Yes, uh, we have one more person. Okay. Um, and if you wish to testify, please uh, raise your hand or um, yeah, if, uh, if you'd like to testify. Uh, Lydia Stewart. Lydia Stewart, are you there? Lydia Stewart. Lydia, are you there? If you're on the phone, you can dial star six to unmute Lydia. There's no Miss Stewart in attendance. Okay. Ina, is there anyone else here to testify on this item? I don't believe so, but we should double check the phone lines. Okay. If you wish to testify on this item, uh, please put your name in the chat and state your intention to speak, ask a question, answer for them, uh, all the order requests. So please, one more last call. If you wish to testify, star six, if you're on the phone. Okay. With that, we will close the hearing on Innovation Village. And uh, if you wish to uh, testify, you can still submit your testimony in writing. So thank you. Uh, Aaron, can we move on to the next item? Calendar item number four, 1571 McDonald Avenue rezoning 210230ZMK 210231ZRK. This is an application by 1571 Development LLC pursuant to section, sections 197C and 201 of the New York City Charter affecting 25 tax lots fronting McDonald Avenue, Avenue M, East 2nd Street, and Avenue N. The applicant seeks a zoning map amendment to change the project area from R5C23 to C44L and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area. These actions would enable a horizontal and vertical enlargement of an existing one story commercial building in Brooklyn Community District 12. The resultant mixed use development would rise to 11 stories with ground floor commercial space, extensive accessory parking on the second and third story, and 104 units on the floors above. Approximately 37 units would be affordable pursuant to MIH option two. Community board 12 disapproved this application on June 28th. Would the representative please state your name for the record and present this application? Ken? Yeah, you can be uh, just introduce yourself, then project team, and then you can begin. Uh, Mr. Ryback, who's the developer, was going to introduce the team, and then I'll take it from there. Hi, everyone. Um, Borough President, thank you very much for this uh, a, a presentation, uh, this opportunity. Uh, my name is Sergey Ryback. I am one of the principals of 1571 Development LLC. Um, I'm here accompanied by Ken Fisher, who is our legal counsel, um, and Ms. Rachel, who is his associate. Uh, my firm, Rybick Development, is a Brooklyn company with a Brooklyn office. We have been developing real estate in Brooklyn for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, this particular project is a proposal to develop a multi-story building um, in the Midwood area of Brooklyn. Uh, currently, the site is a, a one-story uh, spa project uh, that is, uh, we're hoping to be open in the next few months. Uh, a little bit of history on the project. Uh, the site was acquired in 2017 
in 2019, one of our anchor tenants left uh, due to business difficulties. And uh, we embarked on a potential to rezone this project and to offer a uh, multi-use uh, zoning and uh, affordable units as well as uh, residential units on this development on top of the spot as well as the adjacent lot. We are here to present to the borough president and the borough, the project. And if there's any questions, we're here to answer them. And once again, thank you very much for your time in this uh, in this meeting and uh, this late evening. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so, good evening. Uh, this is Ken Fisher. I'm a member of the law firm of Cozen O'Connor, and I'll walk you through the application. I'll talk a little bit about what the application would do, the program for the building, the context. Um, and hopefully at the end of it, uh, after answering any questions, the borough president would recommend its approval. Um, Aaron gave a very thorough description of the application. I was tempted to simply say, are there any questions given the lateness of the hour? But if you'll indulge me, I'll walk you through this uh, quickly. So the proposed rezoning area is on the east side of McDonald Avenue. It's between Avenue M and Avenue N. It's just north of the entrance to the Avenue N subway station and the station itself, as well as the above ground uh, F train tracks is adjacent to the site. And one question that I know that came up when we initially uh, briefed staff on this, um, even prior to the adoption of um, zoning for accessibility that requires applicants to contact the MTA regarding pot potential um, access for the uh, disabled, we had already talked to the MTA about that. They did not see an opportunity for them. Uh, but we did uh, meet with them. Uh, next slide, please. So, as uh, as Mr. Ryback said, the site is currently being improved. It's approximately 22,000 square feet plus of what will be called the World Spa, offering a um, a very um, what we think exciting opportunity for people to um, experience uh, various types of, of spa treatments and aim towards the local neighborhood. Uh, many of the uh, groups that live in that area have this as part of their tradition. It received a special uh, permit from the BSA uh, with community board approval in 2018. It's gonna open uh, later this year. Um, and if it was by itself, it would be a tall one-story building with a mezzanine and rooftop uh, parking capacity of about 375 people and 37 parking spaces. Uh, but as Mr. Ryback mentioned, they had the opportunity um, to acquire an additional piece of land adjacent to where they were already building the spa. So we have this unusual opportunity to basically be building a building on top of a building that's already uh, well towards being finished. Next, please. The rezoning area is within the Special Ocean Park uh, Parkway District. That's not affected by um, what we are proposing. Uh, currently, it has an R5C23 uh, designation. And after consultation with the Brooklyn Office of City Planning, we are proposing a C44L, which is an R7A equivalent, um, 4.6 FAR with MIH. Um, this designate, this uh, zoning district, C44L, was actually developed by city planning specifically for uh, corridors like this, commercial corridors with uh, still having a overhead um, uh, rail line, subway line. Um, and it has uh, some features in terms of setbacks and things that are intended um, to accommodate those uh, that site condition. Uh, at the request of city planning, we're doing the entire block. Uh, there's a C23 overlay on the southwest corner of Avenue M and East 2nd Street that's being removed. That does not affect the uh, current uses, uh, which don't take advantage of it. Um, next, please. So basically, our lot, lot 60, occupies the the bulk of the uh, of, uh, of the block, but it is mid block. Um, lot one at the northern end of the block um, has a BSA variance for construction of a four-story educational institution. 
Um, and that site is well into construction. We don't anticipate them taking advantage of the zoning at any time during the useful life of that building. At the other end of the block are a series of um, individual lots. Um, they're not, there's no common ownership as best as we can determine. They have a variety of uses, primi primarily uh, a mix of commercial and residential um, without particular um, uh, pattern. Um, next, please. So the, the proposed zoning would allow us to enlarge the building to create uh, in total about 144,000 square feet um, in a mixed building with about 116,000 square feet of residential use. And then the balance would be uh, commercial, a small amount of commercial being created um, additional to what the spa would occupy. And it, it's proposed to be 108 feet. In the section, you can see that it's that that the uh, residential portion of the building, um, think of it almost as an eight-story building that's put on top of a three-story building, is set back um, on both sides, um, and uh, uh, there's parking that is in between rooftop parking in between the spa building and the residential portion segment. Um, which allows for the residential to begin at a height where it will feel less of the impact of the uh, of the train nearby. Next, please. So, pursuant to the C44L regulations, the new ground floor new ground floor portion of the building would be set back uh, five feet from the sidewalk, and the residential portion would be set back 20 feet from the street line, 40 feet from the elevated uh, train. Um, there are 72 required parking spaces that are provided on the second and third floors, 37 of those to support the commercial spaces and 35 to support the residential uh, spaces. Next, please. This was an EAS project. No significant impacts were identified, um, including to the neighborhood category. We looked particularly at whether there would be traffic impacts on McDonald Avenue because it's a it's a busy uh, street. None were identified. We did provide for queuing for the garage to prevent any kind of uh, bottlenecks um, on that uh, street. The one the one um, uh, aspect of the environmental review that is reflected in the zoning is that the site will have an E designation so that it will require window attenuation, uh, basically a higher standard of windows to keep the noise out, notwithstanding the proximity to the, uh, to the subway. Next, please. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the C44L is specifically for situations like this. It's appropriate because it would accommodate a modest amount of growth along a major neighborhood corridor that's well served by uh, transit. Um, and it gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of commercial uses because the existing C23 commercial overlay is um, uh, doesn't accommodate all of the uh, all of the uses. But primarily, this is a is going to be an apartment building, and I think it's it's critically important to keep in mind that this is one of the most overcrowded neighborhoods in the city. In fact. A 2017 Furman Center report found that that um, in Community Board 12, the predominantly Borough Park, had the third highest severe crowding rate in New York City. Um, and not surprisingly, you know, with all of the new residents have moved into that area and so little new housing being built, the housing shortage has only gotten uh, has only gotten worse. Next slide, please. Thanks. So um, I want to I want to mention uh, uh, one thing before I go into the uh, description of the affordable housing solution, and that is um, Mr. Rybeck mentioned planning for this really began 2019. Uh, that's when we first met with city planning. Um, uh, when the, he was able to acquire the property next door. But in 2018, Community Board 12 Statement of Needs, 2018, made two very important comments. 
One was that there's a critical need for affordable housing, but particularly for large families, and that there were families who were leaving the community because they couldn't accommodate the size of apartments that they needed. And the second was, and I want to quote, we would like for some commercial areas in our district to be rezoned for residential development with an increased focus on affordable housing. Now, at that time, of course, the, the MIH program was in its infancy, infancy. And we've had some discussions since then with stakeholders in the community and, uh, and others. Um, we're proposing uh, option two. Um, but we're proposing option two. I just want to make the caveat that while you're very familiar with the, um, with the required or uh, minimum and maximum AMI bands, um, that doesn't mean that there isn't flexibility in terms of how those get skewed. And we anticipate having conversations with um, the, uh, the councilman and HBD. Uh, the borough president wants to make a recommendation. Uh, we, would, we would welcome that insight as to how exactly we get to that 80% AMI and anticipate that some of the rents will be below what the, permanent, what the um, uh, required uh, provisions are. But we don't have that solution yet. And that's that's not something that we're in a position to project at this point. There is so much uncertainty between construction costs, interest costs, and the uh, and the like. But there is one commitment that um, that Ryback Development has made to the community, and that is that all of the apartments will be at least two bedrooms. Our current proposal calls for two bedrooms and three bedrooms, no studios no one bedrooms. Um, in discussion with the community board, we're contemplating the possibility of including some four bedrooms. We're in short supply in that area, but there will, but, but all of them will be um, oversized. In fact, significantly larger than the HPD minimum requirements for apartments of that size. It's a direct reflection of the need in that community for larger apartments, both in terms of, of, of rooms and also given the likelihood that the typical family that will be occupying them, obviously they're available to senior, to um, singles uh, as well, but we anticipate that many of the apartments will be attractive for, for larger families with, and, and so we're trying very deliberately to accommodate that with larger apartments and with, um, with two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and possibly four bedroom apartments. Next, please. So, you know, this is an area that hasn't seen a lot of growth. Um, there are some apartment buildings nearby. Uh, this slide illustrates uh, three seven-story buildings in close proximity, an eight-story building not that far away. It's interesting if you look at the, um, at the illustrative rendering, as you look out, there's a mix of low-rise and small, smaller apartment buildings um, in, the, uh, in the horizon. That's a function of the special Ocean Parkway uh, district and is not going to change in the foreseeable future. If there's future growth here, it's gonna be along this uh, corridor. Next, please. And there's, there's been some, some activity on the development front. Um, in the last few years, the community board has approved three projects, uh, two of them just under the size of this at 95 feet, one of them uh, taller than this, approved at 115 feet. And you can see them illustrated. And again, these, are, these were approved by the council uh, between 2018 and, uh, and now. Uh, next, please. So um, as was reported, the community board uh, did recommended against the, uh, the application, but there's a context to that as well. Um, we presented our original proposal, the application that is before you, and the application that we are asking the borough president to, uh, to recommend. We went to um, a public hearing on this, and during the course of the discussion by the Land Use Committee, we heard a variety of voices, um, some of them saying that this was a project that they could support if it was reduced in size, and if parking could be increased, and if there could be some accommodation for the very large um, uh, families. Um, so we recast the proposal, but we were not given the opportunity to um, go back to the community board to have a second land use committee meeting. 
and we were not given the opportunity to present our proposal at the community board meetings or to engage in a dialogue with the community board at that time. And in fact, although there were some uh, vocal people in the audience, there was no opportunity for public testimony um, other than at the initial hearing on the application as filed. The upshot was that while the community board um, uh, disapproved, it was by a vote of 17 to nine with six abstentions. And I, I know that you're well aware that under the charter, an abstention is considered a no vote. So for all practical purposes, this was a 17 to 15 vote um, that um, uh, you know was was um, uh, the ultimate action by the uh, by the community board. Notwithstanding that, we are expecting to continue to engage with them in conversation. Um, the public review process is, as you know better than most, in, um, involves not only this hearing but also proceedings before the city planning commission where we look forward to testifying, as well as the city council, which will ultimately uh, uh, pass on this. So council member Yeager attended both the land use committee meeting and the community board meeting. Um, he has uh, uh, you know, had some conversations with us. Uh, it is a work in progress. I don't wanna represent what his position is in any way, um, but I know that we'll, he'll give us a fair hearing and try and balance the needs of the community um, with um, the needs of the community. So we're hoping that uh, the borough president will support this. And if you turn to the next slide, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ken. Uh, a few questions for you. Um, on the original proposal, uh, how many, um, are all those parking spaces required? Um, and yeah, I guess that's the first question. Yeah, in the original proposal, all of the parking spaces were, were required. Um, at the request of the community board, we did a study to determine how many spaces the project could accommodate. Um, and with attended parking, that turned out to be about 121 spots. Uh, but the application before you has uh, 72 parking spaces. Okay. Yeah, and the C44L district um, was designed, like you said, for uh, adjacent properties to transit. So um, I think not necessarily question, but you know, I think there's a, a you know, question. I guess is you know, how, how do you justify the neat additional parking when you have a zoning district that is clearly, you know, and developed and created for TOD development? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. And, and it's, you know, it's one where I think reasonable people can differ. And um, because the ability to accommodate more parking through, through a valet system didn't require design changes, I think the developer is, is, is flexible on this. It is an area that's directly adjacent to a, a subway station, but it, it's also a reality that you know, particularly people with families and, and seniors um, in that community where so much of their shopping and, and, and so forth is, is local, you know, many of them do rely on, on automobiles and parking is in short supply. There are other parts of Borough Park, and I expect to be having this conversation with you later in the year, um, where new buildings, many new buildings were built, and many of them have garages that aren't full. Um, and, you know, so I think you have to look at it on a case by case basis. And is there some balance between the number of parking spaces that we proposed and the maximum that we could accommodate? Yes. And if the borough president has a recommendation on that, we're, we're happy to take that into consideration as we move forward. Thanks, Ken. Uh, last question. Um, just want to know just in the, the, I know the community board. Uh, brought up some concerns about congestion and vehicular conflicts. Uh, um, can you just describe how you plan to address those concerns? I was just say we 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 uh, we use the the Roth Group firm to uh, study this. We specifically picked them because they had done the um, environmental review for another project not far away on McDonald Avenue. They were very familiar with the conditions. In fact, Hiram has somebody on his staff out of DOT that. Um, was uh, uh, assigned to this. 
Uh, and the long and the short of it is that this is not going to exacerbate the conditions. Obviously, when you have somebody that's crossing a sidewalk, uh, particularly with the pillars the way they are, there's a, you know, there's a there's a, a a question of whether that's going to have an impact. The study did not indicate that, but critically, we did provide for queuing within the um, uh, the building, so we don't anticipate that there's going to be cars on the sidewalk blocking pedestrian traffic um, in the building and then out of the building, or vice versa. Okay. Thank you, Ken. I believe that is all the questions we have. So thank you all. This panel is dismissed. Thanks again. Thank you. So we will now open for public comment on this application. Speakers will be called in the order of the chat requests. We will then take testimony from attendees on the phone. Please note comments are limited to two minutes. So, Ina, who's first? Uh, we do not have anyone uh, asking to testify in the chat. Okay, if anyone wishes to testify on this item, please on the phone, please dial star six and speak now. Okay, with that, we will close this hearing and we'll move to the next item. Erin, can you read it or move on? Calendar item number 5, 280 Bergen Street rezoning, 220188ZMK, 220189ZRK. This is an application by BNW3 Region LLC, pursuant to sections 197C and 201 of the New York City Charter, affecting most of a block bounded by Bergen, Nevins, and Wyckoff Streets and 3rd Avenue. The applicant seeks a zoning map amendment to change the project area from M12 to R7A and R7D C24, and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area. These actions would enable four, three, and nine story buildings with 300 units, 90 affordable units pursuant to MIH option two, as well as 19,600 square feet of commercial and community facility space in Brooklyn Community District two. Community Board 2 disapproved this application on June 27th. Would the representative please state your name for the record and present this application? Jay Siegel, I'm the land use attorney from Greenberg Traurig. And I have um, with me uh, quite a few people. I don't see all their faces, but we have Rich Dillon, who is representing ownership. Um, Sean Dawson, the architect, Abby Rudo from VHB, and my colleagues from Greenberg Traurig, Mark Weppern, and Dan Eggers. Um, I think we're ready to go. Dan, you have control of the screen? Uh, we do, but we can move advance it for you. Hi. I'm temporarily unmuted, so I'm gonna have to hold my hand on this uh, this button the whole time. Sorry about that, but I think I have a little difficulty. Okay, so I think you know this area as well as anybody. This is the block between um, Wyckoff and Bergen and Third um, and Evans, and we are um, seeking to do a rezoning. You've seen this recently. You seen the application made by the gas station on 3rd Avenue, and it's now gone through the system. And we were very consistent, almost entirely consistent with what they want. And now we're seeking to rezone the balance of the block to a lesser FAR than they rezone 3rd Avenue. Um, Dan, can you change the slide? Okay, well, you can see um, the anomaly for this block. This is in the sea of residential. And in 1961, this block two was residential. What happened was the predecessor of our client, Ulano Corporation, um, wanted to expand their manufacturing facility in the early 70s. So they made an application to rezone the block to manufacturing so they could expand the manufacturing. Um, and now what's, what's caused us to be before you is Ulano was consolidating its manufacturing operations 
both to another location in this country and some of it overseas. Okay, if you move next slide, Dan. So just, I, I know you know the area very well, but this is uh, looking at it from Third Avenue. You can see Alano as the building a little bit in the distance. And there is the gas station that was before you just a couple of months ago. Next, please. Okay, now this is an overview of the site and of the block. The block is 110,000 square feet, and Alano, through its ownership, which is the yellow, Alano owns a little more than 50,000, and they lead, lease a little more than 19,000 square feet from city. It's the purple parcels. So collectively, through their ownership and their leasing, Alano has control of 70,000 square feet of the 110,000 square feet on the block. Okay, so next, Dan. So as we can skip this in, in the interest of time, move along to the next photo. So this is a close up. You can see the buildings are, are old, um, not in great shape, um, and the manufacturing business has been down. Um, and they're losing money for a bunch of years. And so uh, Lano is moving, um, and the proposal will be, we'll show you the rezoning in a minute. So let's do the rest of the block. Again, I'm showing it to people who know the block probably even better than I do. So <laughs> we'll, we'll go quick. Next, please. This is Wyckoff, and these are the, as you'll see in a second, um, Alano has uh, three sites on Wyckoff, two really small, there'll be townhouse buildings and a little bit bigger one. Next, this is the HPD parking lot on Evans. It's a nice large site, over 11,000 square feet. Okay, move next, please. Okay, we don't have to show this one again. Let's move along. Okay, so here's what we're proposing. As you know, um, on the left-hand side is existing conditions, reflects the 3rd Avenue rezoning and the rest of the block other than the townhouses is zone M12. And we're proposing to rezone it to R7A. As you know, the R7D that was rezoned is 5.6 FAR. The R7A is 4.6. The R7D is 115 feet max, and the R7A um, is 85 feet max. Okay, next, please. This is some samples of what we would likely, like, would likely be done on Bergen. The, though we have a long um, stretch of about uh, 300 and 400 feet all in, um, we would be doing it in um, several different architectural styles and looks. This is a view on one side. The other, please. Next. Looking the other direction on Wyckoff. Be something a little bit different. Okay, now just to look at the massing now, uh, it's certainly not going to look like this, but this gives you a size of the maximum. We've shown you the maximum size that could be built, the 95 feet. There's a total of four buildings that will likely be built. There's this large one on Bergen, although it'll be broken down in different massings. And then on Wyckoff, there's a smaller building. Um, it's also going to be about 95 feet. Then there's the two townhouses that fit in those small spaces that we showed you. Collectively, the floor area is 238,000 square feet, almost entirely residential. There's about 5,000 square feet of commercial above grade and about 5,000 below grade. Anticipate a community facility about 5,000, but obviously it's predominantly residential. We estimate about 300 units. Um, of housing, and uh, depending upon the options, if option two would be 90 units, option one would be 75 units. Although we're proposing option two, we are flexible. We appreciate that a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, if it were option one at 75 units, as you know, the 10% at 40% AMI would be about 30 units at 40% AMI. Okay, um, the other view, just to give you the view, uh, looking at it from Wyckoff Gardens, uh, this is the view from Bergen, switching from Wyckoff Gardens, you see the smaller building that still would be approximately the 95 feet and the two townhouses. 
Okay, and then there's, I guess there's the last slide that shows the MIH options, but you know better than I do. We just, again, put the 16-80% uh, averages, the 40% would be a lot less. Okay, so let's go to the, um, I think we're finished with slides for now, and we're gonna discuss what happened at the community board. We haven't received, you know, I think we can finish with the slide now, Dan. Um, we- yeah, I, don't, I don't have the control. You, you, okay. You and your camera's off. My camera's off. Okay, I'll put it back on. Try to put it back. I am, I'm back. Okay, am I back? No. They don't wanna let me come back. It's okay, Jay. We, we, there, you, there we go. Okay, we see. Good. And you knew what I looked like anyway, John, right? <laughs> okay. That's right. <laughs> Maybe I'm better with it off. All right. So, no, thank you for that. So the community board had three concerns, three major concerns. Um, one is they didn't like our parking. We didn't show you parking, uh, but we had 125 spaces, uh, somewhere between 110 and 115 were required. Um, they thought it was too much height in mid block, and they thought the affordability should be deeper. Those are the major concerns. And, and we immediately responded to their first concern about parking. Within a matter of days, um, we, we talked to city planning and, and we talked to a few people and it seemed that uh, unlike my brother Ken Fisher and his issues with Community Board 12 where they want more parking, um, we were surprised to hear they wanted no parking. Maybe we should have been more astute. But we made an application, uh, we immediately started the process at city planning. We um, filed the preliminary application statement. City planning seems to be incredibly on board. They waived the ID meeting, they waived the worst case memo, yeah, I know that's really surprising. And we're in the process of preparing our application materials um, and a tech memo. They said a tech memo would be sufficient. We don't need any guess. So we were very hopeful of being certified before the end of the year. Um, so we've been very responsive to that community concern. The, the concern about density, we, we really don't think it, it is warranted. I mean, and one of the many reasons is that they point and they point properly to the fact this is a transportation hub area, and that's one of the reasons they didn't think we needed parking. And for that same rationale, it's a good place to have housing, that you have a transportation hub. And it is a step down from, at least in, in size, from the Wyckoff Gardens, and we think it's an appropriate density. Uh, the third concern about lower affordability, we understand. And we're also mindful, we did read your recommendations uh, with respect to the gas station site, and, and, and we see that you recommended that HPD issue an RFP on the lots that we still have 40 years left on our leases. <laughs> we saw that you suggested that they issue an RFP and do the entire sites for affordable. Um, and we, we and, and I'm sure you're aware, John, we've had some preliminary conversations with HPD and with the council member, and we'll be happy to have them with you as well about um, moving in that direction. But there's still preliminary conversations, nothing has been signed, nobody's agreed to anything, but we understand um, the community's concerns and your concerns about having additional um, lower AMI affordable housing in the area. That's it. Great. We, we recognize that it's about midnight now. And <laughs> It's past my bedtime, Jay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, just a couple questions. We'll get to the testimony. Um, you know, like you said, you know, it's, it's you know, the community board had that concern about parking. I think the borough president shares that concern. So, just looking to understand how that space would be utilized in the future. Um, I think it's just something to consider. I think um, in terms of, you know, the ground floor uses, I think, you know, there are costs for Wyckoff Gardens. You know, the, there might be. You know, if, are there opportunities in your mind to engage um, residents there on what kind of um, you know, ground floor uses in terms of you know community facility, uh, medical child care facilities, something like that? Um, are you open to conversations like that? We certainly are, and um, you know it, the, the the council member is organizing something in the next couple of weeks. We've met with Wyckoff Gardens tenants once, but it was an exploratory meeting. You know, we we explained what we wanted to do. They didn't seem to have any objections, but we weren't talking about the particulars about what you, the things that you mentioned, John. Okay. So, Wyckoff Gardens, the Borum Hill people, um, some other neighborhood groups, and uh, I understand two members of the community board. 
uh, will be at this meeting that place in a couple of weeks. So yes, we're certainly willing to engage about those uses. All oh, great. Um, I just I know this is the first um, racial impact study that was uh, included in a, a ULERP. So just wanted to under just ask the question: um, What were your conclusions from that report? Um, you know, we see seventy five percent of the units will be marker rate. Um, you know, do you feel like that exacerbates or uh, uh, or just exacerbates displacement or segregation in the area? And uh, beyond creation of the new affordable housing units, do you believe the 90 MIH units are sufficient to alleviate those trends? Yeah, you, you know, this was a, we're feeling our way through this first report as well. Um, and I think the, the most we could say is that by providing a lot of affordable housing, especially if those HPD lots, um, it actually works out that they're done exclusively for affordable housing, that's close to another 100 units. Um, so with the 75 to 90 that we'll do in the HPD lots, we're talking about adding an awful lot of affordable units. And um, I trust that uh, that will advance the, the, the concept of equality in the area to a significant degree. Great, thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, team. I believe that's all our questions. So you're dismissed. Thank you so much. And so we will open this up to public comments on this application. Speakers will be called in order of chat requests. We will then take testimony from attendees on the phone. Please note that comments are limited to two minutes. Ina, who's first? Our first speaker is Howard Collins. Howard, you may begin. How are you there? You can dial star six to unmute yourself, Howard. Howard, you there? We can come back to him. Ian is the next person. Our next speaker is Rachel Hong. Rachel. Are you there? Rachel Skull? Oh, you're probably the applicant team, right? Rachel Hall. Right, Dave, Dan, or no? Hello? 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 Rachel Skull? Yes, hi. Okay. Are Rachel Skull or Rachel Hong? This, the person we called is Rachel Hong. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Rachel Hong. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Rachel. Um, I'm actually a new member of community board 2. Uh, I attended both the hearing and meeting where the land use committee voted and also attended the executive meeting where they voted on behalf of the board due to the summer recess. Um, I just wanted to come and voice my support for this rezoning. And if I had been able to vote for it, I would have. Um, I believe that Mr. Siegel's team has taken into account the community board concerns by, you know, for example, by reducing the parking including this rezoning because of its proximity to the transit Atlantic Barclays. And I just uh, appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, I think this rezoning is a really good opportunity for our district to replace a warehouse that currently has zero housing, zero affordable housing and replace that with uh, residential units all like in a neighborhood with transit and something in a neighborhood that's really viewed as desirable. Um, the fact is that people with money can live wherever they want, whether there's new housing or not, because they can pay more in rent than existing residents of a neighborhood who aren't protected by rent control. So I would much rather build more housing and replacing warehouses with uh, housing abundance so that New Yorkers with less money are not pushed out. Um, yeah, I just think that because there are so many more jobs than housing in um, our city and in our borough, this lack of housing is super concerning and I want New Yorkers to be able to stay in New York. But I also don't think I'm alone in wanting our city to be a welcoming haven for LGBT youth or people of color who don't feel safe in their current state or community um, or for women in states where their rights are being taken away, for refugees. Um, who are leaving war-torn areas uh, and they might have community here. 
Um, I could go on and on, but I just want to support this project because I don't think that we can be a truly welcoming city if we don't have enough housing for people who move here and for people who have lived here all their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Howard, you're up. Okay, can you hear me now? How about that? <laughs> I can hear you now. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Howard. Thank you, John. I'm uh, Howard Collins, president of the Borham Hill Association. And we also want to see residential, residential development on this site. Uh, manufacturing is on its way out, but we don't actually support the proposal as drawn because we'd like to see a different scale and context, which you think are important. And we think this is a transitional block between the brownstones to the west and the higher scale to the east. So we would like to see an R7B designation or six stories, which again, which match the housing on the other side of 3rd Avenue. Uh, we would like to see it integrated as R7B and, and preserved. We don't think that the nine stories next to three story buildings is appropriate. Context is important and we want to maintain context and move to where we want to be. So we look for some intelligent response to that issue from the developer. It was part of the discussion at the community board, not as specifically on R7B as I just mentioned. Now, I should say that uh, we went through the 80 Flatbush development process in ULERP, and it's, again, scale has become a very sensitive issue in the neighborhood. We would, on the other hand, uh, want to make sure that of real affordability, there's a lot of 60% AMI, 80% AMI, there's a lot of middle-class housing. We would like to see, no matter what happens, that there's real affordability, we were happy to see the parking waiver uh, if it goes through, saves a lot of money. And we'd like to see senior housing, family housing. Previous proposal this evening talked about, oh my God, three bedroom house, three bedroom apartments. That's unheard of. Uh, we realized that the HPD lots could get 100% for affordable housing, but we'd like to know that that actually would be in the plan and be built, that there's a commitment to build that by people who would really deliver it. Uh, we are also still looking for affordable housing at Pacific Park Atlantic Yards. I think that's my two minutes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Howard. Really appreciate your testimony. Ina, do we have anyone else signed up? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have, and I, again, I, I apologize if I mispronounced her name, Oju Sate. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yeah. My my name is Ojus, but you did a great job, Ina. Thanks so much. Um, and I really appreciate being able to uh, speak. Um, my name is Ojus. I live in CB2. I'm a frequent attendee of the of the ULERP meetings and a, an avid watcher of the you know the proceedings. Um, I just want to say I like. Uh, I really support this rezoning. I really support this development. I heard the you know arguments from both sides in in the community board hearing and in the executive meeting, and I just am not persuaded by the issues of context anymore. You know, I, I really think that we're in a housing crisis. I think a lot of people think that a lot of people are writing about it, and I think that like it's okay if we behave like it too. And I think we can you know accept density in areas that we didn't have density. I mean, if the if the middle of the block is taller than it used to be, I think that's like the price we pay for being a desirable place for people to live. And I think that's okay. And I think we should, we should, we should welcome that. Um, I, I think that, you know, job, uh, someone before me was saying, you know, job growth is outpacing housing, and it's outpacing it fast and in like a concerning way. And I think that this rezoning is terrific. And I'm really glad to see it. And I also really respect that people want, you know, afford, extremely affordable housing and for seniors. And I, I loved those earlier proposals that did that, did that too. Um, but I would, I would just remind everyone that it's a warehouse now, and and no one can live there. So I, I am an eager supporter of this, and I, I hope that the, uh, the office. And thanks again for the, for the time. I really appreciate that. You know, we are able to speak here. Thank you, John. Um, looks like we have Ina's Michael next. Uh, 
Uh, yes, we have Michael Munigan, but I think he's speaking on a prior application. Um, so if we're ready to close this one and perhaps take any outstanding comments on prior applications, we can do that at this time. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on this item? All right, and if you wish to speak on the telephone, please dial star six. Justin? Yes, Michael. You wanted to testify on <laughs> another item, right? Yes, hi. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Oh, yeah, just me hold, um, on. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay. Hearing no one else wanting to testify on this item, this item is closed. Just want to say I, I I just want to say that we uh, we try to go through the uh, system to speak, but it wouldn't allow us to do it. We emailed our testimony to Ina, and so we don't waste any you know keep anybody longer than we need to. Okay, we appreciate you submitting. If anyone does wish to submit their testimony in writing, we will. I always accept it and deliver it to the bar president for his consideration. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank you. Thank you. The hearing on these yield items is now closed. I will review the, uh, the borough president will review the application, submit his recommendation to the city planning commission, which will hold its own hearing on these items at a later date. Thank you everyone for your participating in tonight's public hearing. Viewers may submit additional comments by email to askreynoso at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Thank you, John. Is now adjourned. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Here.